I call the meeting of the Ordinance Committee to order, it being May 23rd, 647 p.m. Present with me tonight are Councilors Lopez, Councilor Jordan, Councilor Lisi, Councilor Bartley, and I'm Linda Vacan. You have a bunch of other counselors here too. I'm waiting for the counselors to get to the table. You might want to grab a mic. You tried. I tried. With us in the chambers, we also have Councilor Greeny, Councilor Leahy, Councilor Sullivan, Councilor Roman, Councilor McGivern. I don't see. Do I see Marco? Yes, I do. Okay. We have a long agenda. I've had a number of requests to go out of order for some of them. Um, and I see a number of people who have come down to help us with these orders. So right now, because one of these was a public hearing continued to tonight at 630, I'd like to entertain a motion to take up item three and reopen the public hearing. Second. I need a motion. So moved. Yep. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 So item three filed by Councillor McGivern and Councillor Leahy ordered that the council review and amend section 7.1.6 of the city's zoning ordinance regarding drive-in takeout restaurants and consider amending the special permit for commercial drive through and or add a special permit for restaurant drive through And we have Marcos Marrero here tonight. There were some questions raised at the last public hearing and some questions about what the original language was and what the changes are. And we have some language for the committee members from legal. For the record, uh, we're seeing this for the first time today, correct? Yeah. I did receive um, a copy by email, but I couldn't see the red line okay. because of the nature of my software, apparently. <laughs> so I think because of some of the technical issues in this, I think the best thing might be um, if Marcos, you could run down the ordinance and the changes from the top. Sure. Uh, Thank thanks you. for the invitation to be here. Uh, the old uh, drive-in takeout uh, restaurant ordinance, as, um, as it was written, was um, at the same time uh, short and vague, um, but also overly restrictive, restrictive in some senses. Um, so 7.1.6 refer to takeout restaurants only, but there's of course other drive-throughs that aren't specifically restaurants. Um, and it only had four points. Uh, so it didn't really speak to uh, performance issues of a drive-through that the community would care about. Um, one of the points, however, that we felt was very restrictive was point three under 7.1.6, which was entrance or exits for vehicles should not be within 200 feet as measured along the public street of a school, playground, church, or related facility, library, museum, hospital, or nursing home. So you know, this is understandably a prescriptive approach that could be a, a, a shortcut for you know, anything that will have a lot of um, you know, traffic or, or, or attendance to, you, know, you don't want to put a, a, a drive-through next to it because of potential conflicts with, with the, uh, the right-of-way. But the, the best way of doing it is just look at the drive-through, not just say, you know, 200 feet. There's, there's nothing magical that happens at, you know, foot 201 or, or, or you know, foot 199. Uh, so what we, what we tried to do here was, so in terms of the red line, these four points under 7.1.6 go away entirely, and it gets replaced by... Uh, the two pages that that was uh, suggested by the planning board in their in their last uh, meeting, um, and so what it does is it it defines a drive-through facility. Um, it it more clearly lays out some things that are current policy, like for example, um, the 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 standard policy of the DPW is that uh, a 
the driveway access is standard 22 feet. Um, the queuing lines, it establishes how much that would be for a restaurant. That would be uh, eight, eight, eight vehicles uh, behind the order board. Um, for a retail establishment, such as a pharmacy, it would be five. Uh, for a financial institution, it would be four. And a freestanding ATM machine, three. So va various degrees of, of impacts of uses would have different, uh, different stacking uh, lengths. Um, in terms of the zoning, it, it maintains drive-throughs in every zone that was available before. It doesn't change that. The only tweak that it provides is that uh, we noticed that in the business limited zone, um, you could have a drive through for a restaurant, which is the highest impact that you could imagine, but you, you seemingly you, you don't you aren't able to have one for an ATM and that just seemed weird. So um, through the by, by making this tiered system, it, it, it would make it available for that. Um, an, an ATM drive through in, um, in a business limited. Um, and so it, it establishes a, a procedure for review. It keeps it under the city council special permit process, but it clearly lays out, you know, the permitting. You know, you, you have to fill it out with a with a um, with the city clerk with a copy to DPW and the planning board. Um, so the planning board can emit uh, comments uh, for situations where they're not doing a full site plan review. At least they can provide some sort of comment or recommendation to to the city council as a body, whatever committee it, it ends up going to. Um, and then if a, if a facility changes its type of use, so say a drive through is permitted for you know, a dry clean or pickup service, something like that, but then later on it changes to a restaurant, obviously that would have a bigger impact. That would, they would have to come, come back to the, to the city council for that. Um, for the most part, then it just it, it refers to other, other ordinances in our um, in the existing zoning ordinance, such as for traffic impact studies, just referring to what's already on the books for traffic impact study. Uh, it's referring to the special permit process, which is already in our in our books under the city council, not, uh, not, not section 9.3 of the city of Holyoke zoning ordinance. Um, so it makes it much cleaner uh, and understandable of what the process is, um, and not just these four points. That other than that, it's it's just not spelled out. What are the criteria that that the planning board, or in this case, actually the, the city council, would be looking for? Thank you, Marcos. I just have one quick question. Would there be anything under this type of special permit, if we're broadening the scope and making it more flexible, that would prevent us from adding in language that would also include considerations of the character of the neighborhood and quality of life considerations, like we have in some of our other? special permit language um, the the phrases are present in 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 this language of, of course the that city council add. has has the power to to add or subtract as it as it sees fit yeah thank you Councilor Bartley yeah Marco thanks you did a lot of really great work here and this is a this is a big improvement I didn't really get it the last meeting but this is yeah this is head and shoulders above what what we have and uh, just uh, under 7165, Marcos, uh, just two things. One, under 2A, it says the required fee. What, what is the required fee? Um, a good question. I don't know what the fee is. Uh, we, didn't, we weren't looking to change the fee, so it's, it's, I mean, it's probably somewhere established what the fee is. It's not, it's not the planning board's uh, permit, so I'm not really sure. <laughs> Not the answer, not a great answer, but I can find out for you. Whatever the fee was before, it would be now. Well, should, should the fee be in the ordinance, or, or, or is a fee is a fee somewhere else? Um, I think usually there's a table of fees. I, I don't remember well, seeing why fees just, in why specific. Why don't we put it in the section. ordinance and just make it real easy? If that's and what what is, I I just want to keep the fee the same. So whatever it is. And again, whatever the body's pleasure. I, I don't remember seeing a fee in actual ordinance language throughout okay. the text, but okay. Well, that, that's just something. If we do put into legal form, we could just ask the city solicitor to do that. And then just uh, um, just a small point: the, the the numbers just don't go sequ sequential. We kind of go one, two, four. Yes. So that if, was we, if we could just uh, if we could just update that, that'd be there's awesome. Al there's also a typo in seven one six three four. It says stacking laid. That's meant to be stacking lane, so just. <laughs> uh, it is, yes, yeah, it says lane. On the, on the last sentence. Yeah, I see it. No, right here, Rebecca. Thank you.
Thank you, Madam Chair. Councilor McGivern. Thank you, Councilor Bacon. I, I think your question is a good question, but I, I, if I understood it correctly, we would always have the right to put conditions on special permits of any nature, which is part of why we do special permits, because every neighborhood is unique. And, and I think the reason I asked, a big reason we asked to change the language is because this language doesn't allow the flexibility right. we need to address different neighborhoods. Um, citing the two examples at the last two public hearings, that being the last two uh, drive-through permits we voted on, were, were problematic. And, and somehow between us and the planning board, we were able to resolve that, but it was not easy with this type of language. There's a, a new developed proposal uh, before us the development is on the corner of Hamden and Pleasant Street. The drive-through was only a small part of that development, but the uh, you know the you, one of the vendors that wants to go into the uh, that development to make it a goal financially needs the drive-through, and, and certainly I, I think that's the significance of, of getting this language changed as quickly as possible. And I know the, the committee has been working very hard on it. I know the planning boards and the, and the planning department has worked very hard on it. I've gone to two of their public hearings. As you know, they, they closed their public hearing and recommend that we adopt a new language. It does not take away our ability to deny a special permit outright. So we can stop a drive through with, with no reasons, just because we don't believe it fits the neighborhood, we don't believe it fits the, uh, the property or, or, or the traffic or whatever impacts that we see it. But by, by adopting this language, it allows us to go forward and to allow developers to come forward before us. And I would just ask the uh, committee, if, the, if at all possible, they could uh, close out the uh, hearing tonight and get this language to the full city council. Thank you. Are there any members of the public here to speak in favor or against this proposed drive-through change? As far as I know, your first name is Melville, right? Yeah. Seeing none, Councillor Jourdain. Oh, good, thank you. Um, Marcos, thank you. Uh, it looks like a nice product you've come up here with. You've obviously given this a lot of thought, and that's appreciated. A couple of questions I wanted to ask you is one of the review, uh, one of the revisions um, was to remove small lots, 100 by 100. Um, is is there an example where we would want? Um, would a lot that small, 1,000 square feet, or, well, that'd actually be 10,000 square feet, 100 by 100, that would be able to accommodate a drive through uh, No, so we, we took it out because it was, um, it was redundant. The requirements, um, at least for a restaurant, say, you would need in a drive, in, so we, we define what a stacking space is, and a stacking space is 20 feet by 10 feet. Usually a parking space for, for frame of reference is 18 feet by 9 feet. So we're giving uh, additional space uh, because when you're in a, you know, you don't want cars to hit each other basically because you're kind of in, you're going to be in movement and you're going to start and stop. Uh, so if you take eight cars by 20 feet, it's going to be 160 feet queuing. Uh, you know, you're not going to be able to, to fit that on a 100 by 100 uh, lot. A lot. Cause remember, you still need a building. <laughs> you, know, you need a facility. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, it, we, we felt it was redundant, so we took it out. I'm a belts and suspenders kind of guy, you know. I, I know some of these things perhaps are, are redundant, but isn't it also helpful, though, to say if really these small lots – um, you know, can't physically have it, then why don't we just by way of disclosure just say these small lots of whatever size just could not even apply? Is that is that a reasonable? I, I, I can't think of a, of a situation where it would be uh, a problem. Yeah, so if that's thank something you. That's... I appreciate that. Next question I wanted to ask you about is... Um, of the of the list of different protected uh, categories of folks, you've got schools here, playgrounds, churches, libraries, museums, hospitals, nursing homes, things of that that have certain this two hundred foot distance, which is eliminated in this. I think back in there, I believe there it's, it's one hundred feet on a on a residential district. Um, let's just say we eliminated that and now the council says yeah you know yeah there's a house next door but you know or a set of houses next door but we think 
yeah, put it next to their house. You know, we're going to allow a new drive through to come in and, you know, and they're sitting there queuing in cars because it's, uh, I don't know, Burger King or pick any one of the many fast food restaurants. And this is plopped down next to somebody's house and it's on the other side of the, you know, cypress trees or whatever little barrier they use or a plastic fence. Is that something we really would want people to have the authority to do, to say that, you know, yeah, that's that's fine. Or some of these ordinances are designed to protect the abutters. I mean, if you're in a commercial zone and it's well spaced out, it's really not an issue. But it seems to me some minimum limitation to to people's homes is helpful. I, I would be concerned about totally having no buffer from residences. Right, absolutely. That's a that's a very good point, which is why I, I should differentiate. There are two types of buffers in the in the old and the new. One of them we kept. Okay. Um, so there is the buffer from the the facility itself, the order board, the window, uh, that, that that you know, the ATM machine to the residential property, and so that buffer of a hundred feet from the residential property line is is maintained. Okay. There, Can you just point me to where? Um, in the in the old one, it is. Um, it is this the second uh, oh, but it's in number, section. And, and in the new one, it is in seven one six three nine. Yes. Okay. Yes. So this says any outdoor service facilities, menu board speakers shall be a minimum of one hundred feet from the property line. Okay. Except for facilities may be located within fifty from a re if screening from adjoining properties in residence district by plant or other suitable material. Right. So this this is again up to the the permitting authority's discretion where you said you can define what is uh, suitable to each okay. location. So you're saying you, yeah, you could, but it'll be on a case by case basis. So the point well taken and that was considered. Okay. The the the, the issue where we saw it was um, Really prohibitive. It was 200 feet from the entrance to the property to any of these other uses, uh, due to circulation considerations or use considerations or like hours of the day. It may be that it never interacts at all, which is why we've we've specified the traffic impact study. So, the permit granting authority, in this case the city council, will have the ability to look at all that and, and judge whether there's an impact on the residential neighborhood should that situation occur. Okay. Uh, but it won't be absolutely prescriptive that look. Oh, you're at 190 feet or whatever it is. You know, you're, you're on the margin. You just, we don't have the legal authority to do it. I see. Okay. The other thing I wanted to ask you about was um, with respect to some of these things such as width of a driveway, access at the property line of the development shall not exceed 22 feet unless blah, 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 uh, traffic study identifies, DPW approves the need for wider access. Um why, one, one of the other thing I, I guess I want to point out, there's a number of these different distances and depths. Are any of these things governed by current state building rules or building codes uh, currently that we might be either adopting or we're making more strict or less strict than current rules? I'm assuming that in the absence of this, mm -hmm. is there a rule in the general state building code that you know, you can't stack cars more than such and such, you know, on the property at a certain time or any, anything like that. That's strictly... Right. I, I'm not. I'm not familiar with any of those. I. I would say that I. I don't think there is. Um, and so I can tell you about how we. Um, how we came to this rigorous document. Um, we actually took, the lion's share of the document from one of the regional planning commissions, not our own, but that had done you know year-long study into drive-throughs and that sort of thing. I think it was from the southeast part of the state. Um, so we kind of took the best parts of that and adopted it to other other provisions that we had that we that we included um so you know had it the the only the only other numeric provision that we added in there was the 22 feet which is a standard the dpw already uses okay because um, if it's too wide it starts becoming um it starts feeling unsafe for the pedestrian that's walking on the sidewalk where the vehicle f sees this big opening you can kind of zoom into the drive through mm -hmm. so you want to you want to be able to limit that uh, as much as you can there are some situations where like with uh, with trucks 
or maybe you you do want the you don't want vehicles stopping that much um, on the on the right of way. You may want to you know increase it to 24 feet or something like that, mm. 26 feet. But then there's other design considerations uh, for pedestrians that you're going to want to do, like maybe like a rumble strip in the center of the of the uh, of the sidewalk, something like that. I wanted to ask you about the zones where these were allowed. Mm. You list um, seven zones here. Is that the current seven zones? Yeah, we just took that from the chart from, from where where it was allowed now. Principally, okay. okay. So there's yep. been no deviation from that. The only deviation has been that uh, ATM, ATM drive-throughs were not allowed in business limited, and that just seemed odd because that's that's a lower impact use than a restaurant in business limited, which is allowed. What is the um, Yankee Peddler uh, zoned? Uh, I think it's business limited. Okay. Yeah. Now, would there be any coincidence between the fact that the People's Bank has to come in for a special permit for a, a um, ATM drive-through and the fact that there would be allowed versus not allowed under the current rules? Is there a coincidence to that? or? Uh, no, that's that's one of the possibilities that that it opens up. Um, the development at Hamden and, and Pleasant, uh, they had also talked about having a bank as a tenant. Um, that's business limited as well. Um, so under current law, if People's Bank were to demolish Yankee Peddler and come in to apply to have ATM machines at that location, under the current law, they would not be allowed to. Even if they didn't demolish it, if they if they re if they rehab the building, sure, um, they wouldn't be able to. Okay, so I just want to make sure that we're transparent about the impacts. Um, not to say I'm for or against one way or the other. I just I just want to make sure that that's a that just coincidentally happens to be a proposal that's about to be coming to us. So I just think we need to have, you know, everybody knows what we're dealing with. Sure. No, I mean, if, if okay. I'm doing my, my, my job right, I'm kind of aligning, you know, what I think is good, you know, planning policy to, right. to the stuff that I see out there. So okay. I appreciate the question. Thank you. All set? All set. Councilor McGivern. Just a follow-up on that one point. You know, Mark, Marcus, the original reasoning behind the special permit for drive through was, was for food services only. And, and that's why banks were never included and we never paid attention to banks. They still had to be outright within the correct zone to have a drive through, but they didn't need a special permit because it wasn't food service. Is there, there a reason why you think the special permit would apply to ATMs and banks? I think in general the concern is uh, are you going to have queuing of vehicles that, number one, that spills into the public right away? That would be the, the, the first concern. Uh, the second is just the, the general nuisance of having uh, vehicles idling uh, near near other property. So there are other uses that are not just banks, but pharmacies as well. Um, you know, services are being innovated all the time, where you can you know pick up your laundry with with uh, with uh, uh, with a drive-through. We don't have one yet. I don't know of one coming in. But you know, what's the next thing that's going to be invented? You know. So it's it's kind of, it, I'll, I'll also say it's kind of awkward where someone comes in with a you know the list of permits that they need for development is like here here's a drive-through restaurant permit and they're like but that's not what we're doing you know I I understand but at the same time I, I think it's pretty widespread that ATMs bank tellers don't have a lot of backup and pharmacies don't tend to have a lot of backup at their windows either Dunkin' Donuts. Coffee, rush hours, you know, there's a different story. McDonald's, you know, and, and I believe, if I remember correctly, this might have been Councilor Lopez's original order many, many years ago. But it was food services that was our number one concern. So, I mean, we've, we've looked at other existing structures. It, it doesn't seem like any, any of the operating... Um, Drive-throughs would seem compliant. Certainly, the the financial institutions, if that if that's a concern, um, they seem to have a, a, a pretty long track to queue if needed. I mean, they wouldn't have to go you know, if you already have your drive-through. You're existing, but you know, hypothetically, would any of the could we build any of the existing, say, People's Bank drive-throughs? Um, we looked at that. It seemed like they have plenty of runway space. All set. All set. Not seeing any other. Comments or public? Uh, I'll make comments. a motion to close the public hearing. 
Is there a second? All um, in favor? Aye. 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 Just under discussion, Madam Chair. Uh, I just want to put, I'm going to make sure we put language in for the, what the exact fee is under seven six, that last section, section okay. five. And then I just want I just want to fix the numbering system for that as so well. So we'll just request on this motion that it be made part of the legal form so that the fee will be in stated. Is there a second on that? Second. <coughs> All in favor on Aye. the amendment? Aye. Aye. And then uh, just amend the uh, the numbering so it was so it was sequential. Is there a second? Second. And amending the numbering and any typographical errors as noted. All in favor? I, I had one question too, Madam Chair. Councilor uh, Jourdain? On 7.162 applicability, um, was it the intent of the authors of this to state uses shall include restaurants, retail establishments, pharmacies, financial institutions, and automatic teller machines, period? Generally, uh, there should be and automatic telling machines, and just grammatically there. And then there seems to be a period there and if I were to read that sentence it, it is only for those purposes right it says uses shall include was it meant to say uses shall include but are not limited to that you provided some examples of things that would be allowed or did you mean to specifically say if you're not a restaurant a retail establishment a pharmacy a financial institution or not an ATM you may not have a drive through for any other purpose uh, Except the two exclusions for gasoline and a car wash. Right. Uh, I think you're referring to the one where it ends or similar, right? Is that the sentence? Uh, no, I'm referring to uh, the middle sentence of 7.162, which begins with the word uses. Okay. I, I, I may have a, a different version because I have the ATM or similar, so maybe something got, got erased there. That's so the not in our version. Okay, so the intent of that sentence was to, uh, so or similar kind of makes <laughs> kind of makes it break the sentence. That's why I'm calling it out uh, because of the concern of what will they think of next, right? Um, so we have a pretty good universe of the things that we can think of now, okay. but what will be provided through a, a drive-through, um, yeah. you know, ten years from now, we're we're not entirely sure. So it looks like you're looking for us to make an amendment to this then. Um, if your version doesn't doesn't have and and just ends after ATM, yes, the version I have doesn't have and because it says comma automatic teller machines or similar. Okay. So that, that that would change the whole meaning of the sentence. The yeah, it's we didn't have the or similar, but so is that an amendment? Do you see? I'll make an if amendment. If you see in the um, comment box to the right, it says deleted or, or similar, but it was there in some prior version. Mm -hmm. okay. All right. We want to keep that in, it seems. Okay. Or, or similar uses, period, would be my amendment. Or, okay. I, I got a amendment, Kev, if I may. Councillor Bartley, we have one amendment. And well, just, under, amendment. just under discussion. Kevin, I, Kevin raised a great point, as always. So, uh, you know, uses, you can just change the shell to may, Kev. That, 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 that might clean that up. And I just want to point out that, the, yes, by the way, that the, would help. by the way, the gas and electric, they, they have a drive through and, and I don't see one of their uses listed here. On <laughs> so okay. if you just change the shall to a may, I think that would sort of uses allow may. some flexibility, Kev. Okay, uses may include, okay. So you want to say uses may include blah, 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 or, uh, and automatic teller machines. And you, and you may want to list uh, municipal, municipal agencies since the G and E has a municipal agency. Well, I think we should put that in the next sentence, which is the exclusions. That's the inclusions. The next sentence appears to be the exclusions. It's saying uh, I I would recommend that maybe we exclude, um, you know, municipal agencies. Well, what about the G and E? I mean, they, they, they're, are they a municipal agency? I think they are, aren't they? I think so. I'm pretty sure. Pretty That's sure. why I'm saying you could put them on the automatic. Ex what they're saying is you're not required to get a drive. They're not considered drive throughs if it's, if it's uh, selling of gas or it's accessory functions of a car wash facility or a use by a municipal agency, I think, is what you're looking at. He wants it in. You don't. 
No, I, I do. No, want, I do want it in. Yeah, he wants to add it. I'm for it. I'm for what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. I, I want. I want to include a municipal agency in, as, under, a, as a exemption. So therefore, they, they wouldn't be. They would not be required to have to have one. As okay. A, so right now we have an amendment that is adding or similar uses, and now we have a suggested amendment that changes shall to may yep. and exempts municipal agencies for use. I still like you adding the um, or similar uses mm -hmm. at the end of that sentence with may. Okay. I thought you didn't like that, Kev, last meeting, because you said it's a little too squishy, Sim so, similar uses. But do, All right. Well, that, I mean, that was your suggestion last meeting, because it just wasn't very... So Pipe. to the makers of the amendments, are you open to having may and or similar uses added to that sentence? I'm open to having may, not similar uses. All right, so okay. uses may, and then you're going to put an and okay. then, and before automatic teller yes. machines. All right, that's well, fine. I'll, I'll second that amendment. That's fine. Okay, so... May and and in that sentence. May and and. So in the sentence of inclusion listing the types of businesses, we are changing shall to may and changing the comma before automatic teller machines to and. Yes. And automatic teller machines, yep. Correct. So on the motion, all Aye. in favor? Aye. Aye. Then there is a second amendment offered that in the last sentence, an exemption for use by municipal agencies be added where it now includes a gasoline filling station and a car wash facility. Or a municipal agency operating a drive through would be my um, amendment. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Is the committee ready to act on the full ordinance following approval of the amendments? Yeah, I'll, I'll make a motion to approve as amended. Did we close the public form. hearing? Yes, we did. we did. I'll make a, a motion to um, approve as amended and to refer to legal, put into legal form. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you all. And this will go to legal. Do you want it to come back to committee or be presented at the council in legal ah. form? Legal form. So if we could receive a copy before the council meeting, but we will mm -hmm. take it up at the next council meeting. Thank you, everyone. Sounds good. Motion to take up item number four, four. Madam Chair. Thanks, Marcos. Good job. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Item four, filed by Councilor Lopez, that the DPW superintendent and police chief Come to the Ordinance Committee to discuss the prevention ordinance of panhandling at the following locations by creating or erecting barriers for panhandlers to freely walk across the roadside, soliciting money and interfering with the traffic flow. Listed intersections include Hampton and Northampton Street, Dwight and Northampton, Main Street by 391, 391 Main Street exit, 391 and High Street, Maple Street and Resnick Boulevard, Whiting Farm Road, Mall entrance. Um, Good order, by the way. Can I ask? Okay. So the chief had come down at a previous meeting where we took up a, the next order on the agenda, and this order grew out of the discussion at that meeting. And so, Chief and um, Mr. McManus, thank you very much for coming down. And if we could hear your recommendations, we would be grateful. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Councilors. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, uh, the uh, panhandling issue that's been uh, permeating our city is not just unique to Holyoke. It's it's in Springfield. It's in Agawam. It's statewide, it's national-wide, and if you travel internationally, it's international. It's, it's not unique. Um, so there are no simple fixes. Um, but as we talk about what we've done or what we're trying to do, um, I'm sure most of you are aware, a few years ago we started training the police department in crisis intervention training, specifically 40 hours of blocks of, of training for the officers, so they could um, better manage people that are in... in um, sometimes in a crisis, whether it be through mental health and substance abuse. And we know some of our, 
our, our, our homeless population is, fits into that category. Well, anyways, as an extension of that, we recently started something called a crisis intervention reengagement team, where it's uh, several officers uh, and a uh, rep from Behavioral Health Network that go out once a week for several hours, and they're reengaging some of our uh, repeat customers. And included with that is uh, they went out and um, on one particular night, and they ended up having conversations with eight panhandlers in the city. Uh, of those eight, one of the gentlemen admitted he had a crack problem he had for the last 14 years, and he wanted help. Uh, Behavioral Health was able to refer him to a program outside the city and actually get him some help. Whether he's still involved with that, I can't say. Uh, the other seven people that they interviewed that night, um, uh, none of them wanted any additional help. And, I, and not 100 percent, so I'm not telling you all seven of them, but the common theme of it is they have, have or had had an addiction issue. And that's to where they are. Um, my concern on that is just so you know, um, everybody wants to help out their fellow man or woman that's down on their luck and needs help. I am concerned uh, with what we're seeing in, as far as panhandling goes is I don't think the public realizes. I, I think a lot of times by trying to help out their fellow man or fellow woman by, I, I, at a street corner somewhere, we're actually feeding that addiction. That's not the intention of the public. I just don't think the public understands that. That's not to say everybody does that. But for our little cursory look, I would tell you, for most of the people out there, that does fit. Um, Mike and I did a drive around uh, a few weeks ago to look at the intersections in question. And I'll let Mike expand it out in a minute. There are some areas that we could potentially do some work. Um, I, uh, Mike came up with a better idea than barriers perhaps some shrubbery, which would be more aesthetically looking, but would not be comfortable to be against, so to speak. Um, Poison ivy. <laughs> um, um, and then, as, as we've discussed about this, another option that we came up with is, you know, part of it might be some signage. And, I, and I'm going to be a little rough on my wordage here. Uh, but at some of these key intersections, perhaps something along the lines of, <laughs> The more you give, the more you'll see. To truly help the homeless, go to www. You know, and we would refer them to sites where they could. Somebody wants to help out, wants to make a donation, they could do that. So it's kind of like a public service announcement, but we put it in, in key places where there seems to be this reoccurring issue. Um, and then I'll, I'll turn it over to Mike here for a little bit more detail on some other things. Thank you. Uh, so as far as the uh, the signs. Um, we would. Uh, I talked with uh, Rory and Eileen about developing a website, <clears throat> and it, it could be uh, a website like www.holyocares.org or or something along those lines. A short website that redirects to the city website, and on the city website would be a page that would have links to charitable organizations in Holyoke and the surrounding area where people can make a donation instead of. Uh, giving to panhandlers. Could we direct them just to the charitable organizations instead of making it another, you know, sort of circular trip? I don't follow. Could we put a website that is a website for charitable organizations where it would just, you know. On the, on the sign? Yeah. We could. Uh, the thought was by having uh, a page that lists multiple organizations, then a person could choose where they want their money to go, whether it's a food pantry or a shelter oh, or a rehab facility. We maintain the list. Forever. We will have to maintain the list. Um, that's true. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, so what what I, I've handed out, and I only had uh, three additional copies, uh, were the intersections that were in the order. And if we could go... Uh, down the list. Mm -hmm. uh, the first one, Hamden at Northampton Street. This is right outside Lynch School. Uh, the city does own uh, this part of the road where the panhandlers stand. And uh, what we'd be thinking is putting up a sign and, and replacing the, uh, the lawn or dirt area uh, in between the sidewalk and the road 
that part of the tree belt with some sort of shrub or bush that would be a, a low profile bush so that it wouldn't uh, block sight distance of, of cars but also be an environmental barrier from somebody standing there. I think if, uh, if we put something like a Jersey barrier or some other uh, physical block, it would just, um, that could be bypassed by somebody sitting or, or standing, leaning against it. Thank you. Councilor Bresnahan. Sorry. I just had a quick question because you, you guys brought up a quick point. I mean, in order to get into a, a shelter to get assistance, I mean, you basically have to, you, I mean, you have to be clean and sober, don't you? Or you have to be in a program. I, I couldn't, I couldn't necessarily have a problem and walk into to, into a shelter because they, I don't know that I don't know that shelters will take you in unless it, if it's a rehab shelter or an after treatment program. Um, but I just for as far as homeless shelters go, from my experience, it's basically they, 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 you know you have to you can't be using or you can't be doing drugs or whatever the case may be. So I just. In Councilor, I think this is just an option. Just as I discussed when we. When my, my officers talked to eight different individuals, one was interested in help, the other seven weren't. So, I, you know, we make the offer, we do the referrals, not everybody's going to take us up on it. And then, as you know, you know any with the addictions, to actually succeed is, is a very difficult task for them. Have, do you know, have we seen any, you know, the, my big, one of my biggest problems is that, <clears throat> you know, the, the guy in front of you decides they want to give somebody the change of the corner and you know two cars back sees the green light and starts going and the guy walks three lanes across to get to, you know he or she to get to get some help i mean has has, has there been like a i haven't seen any but i mean has there been accidents reported due to that behavior i haven't uh, queried our accidents at intersections as far as pedestrian involvement um, not to say that behavior doesn't happen but i did query my traffic sergeant to specifically look at uh, jaywalking, uh, sudden stopping or starting, in his, in his opinion, there's nothing quite there that really fits. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. Um, I, I would like to see how this is going to work because uh, people are going to they're going to walk in between, and they're going to, in my opinion, I think uh, we will be spending a lot of money, and I don't think that we're going to get most results. Let me, let me explain what I'm thinking. What I'm hoping that we will do is, and I don't think that you're gonna, you're gonna create any problem for any drivers or any, anyone driving on the street. Let's say, for example, on uh, Hendon and Northampton Street, if you put a fence along the street, see uh, at least more than five or seven feet fence, then you're not going to be allow anyone to go back and forth. And I'm afraid that people are going to step, they're going to stand next to whatever you're going to plan. And it's going to be the same repeat. And I don't know how much money you have to spend on that one. I mean, a fencing will be critical. You will keep them out of that area. You can put sign and you move on. Think about that. In the course of your remarks, if you could um, touch on the, the law on this situation. Now, we know the general rule is that, um, for reasons we won't get into deeply, but we'll just take as uh, stipulate to the fact that, you know, people that want to sit on the sidewalk and put out a sign and say, you know, help me, I'm down on my luck, you know, throw a, throw a quarter in the basket, that's basically totally legal. Right, I think we will all stipulate to that. Question now goes into, um, but courts have not upheld what's called aggressive panhandling. Um, that's on the other, like for example, uh, standing outside of people's ATM machines saying, uh, "Hey, buddy, you know, give me two bucks," you know, um, or you're accosting people, things of this nature. Have we reviewed um, the situation that we're talking about here? Is this this is any type of citizen, forgetting just people, and this is where I think it's content neutral, is can I stand on the corner and, uh, you know, in the front of the mall, forget the guy that's there probably every day asking people for money, you know, they're all queued up and I can walk out in the street in between cars and say, 
give me 50 cents, give me 50 cents, and I can start, you know, knocking on windows and, you know, look, doing this. This is what they do every day, right, that are out there. And, or could I stand out there selling carnations, you know? Hey, hey, I got to, you know, can I do that tomorrow? And go up there, meet Kevin, and have a carnation business in front of the Hoyoke Mall and start walking around inside the intersection when there's a red light? Because I just want to know what is legal in Holyoke and what's not legal in Holyoke. Because whatever is, these people, these uh, vagrants, they are pressing the boundaries of what would seem to me common sense and safety because I have, I don't think it's great, I don't think it's appealing to the community to have people laying all over the sidewalks, you know, with their hand out. Uh, I, I think it looks terrible for the community. But I think they have a protected constitution. I mean, I, I support the law and I support the constitution and they have a right to stand there and do that. However, I don't believe people should have the legal authority to walk around in the middle of intersections in between cars stopped at red lights. And I can't believe that is, that's protected speech. Uh, what, or I can walk in between the cars playing a banjo that says, I love Holyoke. Um, I mean, what, what, are, what, is, what does the law allow us? I mean, you're, you're the law enforcement professional here. What, what's your opinion on all this? So from what I see of the panhandling that goes on in the city, most of it, everybody's standing on the street corner. They're standing in the medium. They're not running in and out of traffic, as you described. I'm not to say that that doesn't, doesn't, hasn't happened. I'm just not seeing that piece of it. And, and then they, when someone, well, I'm just, I'm telling you, I haven't seen it. Okay. So, and when someone stops, they stop, they roll around the window, they walk up, they hand them something, and they move to the next one. That I've seen. But I haven't seen anybody darting in and out of traffic. I haven't queried accidents related to pedestrians uh, in this particular issue. I'm, I'm not aware of any. Now, if they're going to jump in and out of traffic and people are going to jump on their brakes because of it, I think that's an issue. But I'm not seeing that. Well, let me, let me tell you what's happening then uh, uh, from my firsthand observation. Usually it's the one at 391 coming down, is I'm sitting there queued up, and the guy in the middle lane, maybe the second car in, says, and then down goes the window, right, and out comes the dollar bill. He goes, whoop, whoop, and then shoots back, right? He doesn't hold, granted, he doesn't sit there and hold a conversation. That's happening every day in the city of Holyoke. And I'm sure if it's happening there, it's happening all over. So mm -hmm. my question is, you know, I can go in and out and have, you know, these interchanges but with, with cars stopped at red lights. I guess that's legal. As long as you're not impeding the traffic. I, okay. You know, I, I, Counselor, I, I wish I could sit there and say, yeah, you can't do that. The second you stop in the, step on the road, it's reckless use of the highway by pedestrian. Here you go. But it's just not that simple. Okay. I thought, you, you know, I don't know, I, maybe I'm old-fashioned, but I was always taught when I was a kid, you know, you're supposed to use side, you know, crosswalks, and you're supposed to, you know, you're not allowed to hang out in the street when, you know, when there's cars and things of this nature, but I guess uh, you're allowed to do that. So, Mike, if you can touch on these barriers, okay, if we use shrubs, because those are nicer, but I think at one prior meeting we discussed, um, you know, things like, low-level barriers but like chain link fencing uh, or clear like Lexon glass or different things at some of these spots where these people do you think they're just gonna step on the bush and stand there anyways uh, I mean what, what, what do you think will or they'll stand next to the bush uh, well, they, they it both. seems like they'll it seems like that's a there's a these are pretty resourceful people uh, they they tend to they tend to get around uh, these aesthetically pleasing barriers. What, right. What's your thoughts on this? The, the goal would be to have a bush large enough so that there wouldn't be room on the island or in the tree belt for them to stand. Okay. That they would be forced to either stand in the road or on the sidewalk on the opposite side. Okay. Councilor Lisi, thank you. Um, so if we're going in the direction of fencing or barriers of some sort, I think that's going to be far less aesthetically pleasing than having people outside down on their luck asking for help. Um, so I won't be in support of any sort of um, physical barrier. Um, I saw, I was doing some research given that this item was coming up and I saw that Hartford has um, meters, different meters with um, 
different organizations that you could donate to, similar to this idea that you were having, um, which I, I thought was you know a creative idea. Um, but what I really thought was um, innovative and interesting, um, and I filed this order for our next city council meeting, is um, there's models in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and also in Portland, Oregon. I don't know if you um, have come across that at all. Um, the one in Albuquerque, New Mexico, is called um, There's a Better Way. And you, they are soliciting um, donations from um, the business community and also through these signs, for example. But it's a program that Albuquerque, New Mexico, administers on its own. Um, they find panhandlers, and the city brings them in for the day and offers them a meaningful work-based alternative so they could actually earn you know, their money for the day. Um, that seemed like a really creative um, opportunity too. Um, Chief, it sounds like you're starting to do some of this work with the uh, crisis intervention uh, re-engagement team where you're, you're going around, you're finding people, you're offering, offering them uh, an opportunity to get help and to find some meaning, meaningful alternatives um, in terms of um, health care. Um, this, again, um, there's a better way in Albuquerque is um, soliciting donations from the community and then also from the, the businesses in the, in the area to provide um, a living wage work opportunity for panhandlers. And I, I thought that was um, probably a more sustainable um, approach to, to the issue than barriers. Um, Portland, Oregon talks about it as an opportunity crew. And I filed I file this order for the next meeting with links to recent articles that came out about this. Um, but I, I think people that have um, addiction problems um, they need to be provided meaningful alternatives and then opportunities to um, access health health care. Um, so I really like the program that you and your officers have started to implement and in terms of um, a more sustainable approach to uh, mitigating the panhandling problem in the, in the city. I think we need to provide meaningful work-based alternatives. Um, so I, I do thank you for the work you put into this, but I'm not, I'm not enjoying the direction that it's going in, so I probably won't be supporting barriers or um, shrubs of any sort. Thank you. Councillor Sullivan? Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, Chief, can you tell me, what's the difference? Why isn't this simply loitering? Um, you can, you're allowed to stand in a public place all you want. Uh, the way the city ordinances, I think, is worded as far as loitering goes, it's three or more on a sidewalk blocking traffic passing through. So it's uh, three or more people to constitute blocking, lo loitering? Yeah, blo blocking traffic on a sidewalk passing through, that would, that would be in violation of the city ordinance. Uh, but you can stand on a sidewalk all day long in a public place. Stand on a sidewalk, but th these, these aren't sidewalks, they're medians. You can, you, you can stand in a public they're place. tree belts. Some respects, it is. Well, well, I, I, I agree. Shrubbery, it's going to get trampled, it's going to get broken, broken off, torn down. It's another expense to the taxpayer. Same with signs. And you put up a sign like this, it's going to be up so high the driver can't see it to keep it out of their reach. Um, if we're going to spend money like this, I, I would suggest that we put some money put a full page ad in the Hoyoke Sun, uh, maybe the Morning Union, uh, put it on our uh, public service TV with a don't feed the animals and educate the public and let them know that they are doing what we just talked about here tonight. You're fueling the addiction. If there's, besides that, any way that there is that we can simply throw them in jail, arrest them, it's going to make it more uncomfortable for them and make them more willing to seek help. All these other things that we're talking about doing, you, you, we, we talked about here tonight, your, your guys have gone out, they've done a survey, seven out of eight people don't want to be helped because we're making it too easy for them just to stay there. Now I took the time out and I went down to the same one at 391. They get their money, they do exactly what Kevin was talking about, they walk through traffic, other cars stop when there is even a green light. They're impeding the flow of traffic. Okay, um, it, a kid rides up on a bike. There's an exchange of money. They go behind the gas station. 
and then there's needles left on the ground, and then they're back out again, there again in 20 minutes. It's ridiculous. And these same people have been working in the same area for well over a year. The very same people. All right? And barriers aren't going to help anything. It's a crackdown and making it, making it uncomfortable, making them want to seek help, and educating the public so that they'll stop making it easy for them, stop fueling it, and make them need to seek the help, not just get the quick fix. That's, that's how I feel. None of these barriers, nothing's going to work. I, I would just like to add that at the mall entrance, I've also seen people walking into the traffic, regardless of whether the lights are red or green. The people that are developing the hotel in that corner are concerned because they're trying to promote it as a plaza with multiple retail and food options and a walkable area for the people to go to the mall and they have concerns in that regard. Um, I've also, and I don't know if anyone else, has observed what seems to be quite organized behavior in that there are signs and things left and a person leaves and another person comes and picks up where the other person left off and it appears to be very organized and scheduled and routine and to me that seems to be a different kind of behavior than somebody who's down on their luck and is going through town on their way to wherever you know and they're just trying to get their next lap um, so I wonder if you've observed any of that sort of more organized behavior through your research um, I personally haven't seen it. It's not to say it's not out there. Um, I, I think you have people that have their favorite intersections, and if they're making good money at wherever it is, Hamden, Northampton, 391, up by the mall, if they keep going there every day and people keep providing them with the money, and let's say they make $100 a day, I don't know, $200 a day, they're going to keep going back. Mm -hmm. And, and m most of these people... Not all, but most have some addiction issues, past or present. And uh, again, I'm not, I don't want to paint everybody in a broad bush because you know there are people who are down on the luck and need help. Uh, but most of it, from what I can see, is we're feeding the habits. Thank you. Um, Council Roman. Yes, thank you, and I thank you to my colleagues, and I have heard from businesses, I've shared this in the past, that they, yes, do have concern with panhandling issues. I just want to kind of dispel and share my dismay with the tone of the conversation, and with all due respect to my colleague to my right, referring to people as animals, especially being one of those animals who used to be homeless and who used to go to Capri Pizza for a free pizza, who used to stay underneath 391, and when the state chopped down all those trees and my home went away, I take offense to that statement. And I, I respect you to death, Mike, Councilor, I really do, but you can't just call people animals. When I was one of those animals, when I used to stuff newspapers in my shirt to stay warm in the middle of winter off of 391, I was one of those animals. So when we start having these conversations, they're human beings. And yes, there's a small group of the same 10 people. I get it. I do agree with my colleague. They are organized. But to say that the hundreds and hundreds of people who are out there are animals, that's just shameful. And I think that that statement needs to be retracted because you can't have those conversations. I'm willing to work, and the chief knows this. I just left the meeting right now about New Horizons opening a family center in Churchill. To get those people's jobs, you want to start eliminating and talking about getting getting people off the streets, get them good paying jobs, get them out of the streets. But when the jobs are going up the hill or in Northampton or Springfield, we don't have jobs. So I take big offense to that. And I just want to say- The chair, Councilor. Through, the, through you, Madam Chairwoman, and I, and I agree. I, just, I get passionate about this too because I agree, we have to address this. What I want to do is support agencies like Providence Ministry. And I'll stand out there with a sign next to the person when I offer them the job. I'll, I'll get a crew of volunteers say, we offer this person a job today. Uh, and if that person doesn't want to go to work to that day, then we call that one person out. But there are people who are homeless who aren't on the corners. There are people who are struggling with addiction and all these other things and services. It has to be, it takes a village mentality. This one ordinance is not going to eliminate that. It might deter them for a while, but then they're still going to be back out there. So through you, I, and, and my other issue that I take with this, building barriers when I have cracked sidewalks in South Holyoke, when I have the street lights aren't repaired, we're going to spend money on building barriers when the basic quality of life isn't repaired? I take huge offense and issue to that. I would like to see something where there's an actual study, and I thank the, the chief for doing his research, an actual study to really see 
Are these the same 10 or 15 panhandlers we're looking at every day? Is that really the broad scope? Let's work and partner with whether it's Providence Ministries, Kate's Kitchen. Let's get an actual study of these individuals. Let's find their names. Let's find their addresses. Let's count how many times they come and see what services they're missing. But the tone of this conversation, and I even applauded and I stood by my colleague when he filed this to tackle this order because I've heard it from businesses in my ward. But the tone is taking a, a turn to the right. So I'd like to see us have a more comprehensive look. I don't think barriers or brushes or signs are going to fix it. This is a healthy dialogue to have, but I would invite Providence Ministries in. I know they came out with those cards that they're trying to give out. Let's hear what their studies or their researchers have done. So I just, I yield back my time. And again, I apologize for getting so emotional, but I really think that we have to be respectful when we're addressing these issues. Thank you. Thank you. And I urge everybody weighing in on this issue to respect the fact that there are differences of opinion on this matter and that everybody's opinion is valid. And through having discussion and airing differences of opinion, hopefully that's the process we use to come to a better result. Um, so I just um, want to comment for my part and then I'll yield to Councilor Bartley who's in the queue. Um, in my experience, a person who is actively using drugs is not able to routinely work in order to be able to get to that functional level, they have to first be willing to accept help. So I do agree that we have a very complex issue here, but we also have people who are raising issues to us about their quality of life issues in their neighborhoods. And so it is a complicated problem, I agree. And I'll yield to mm -hmm. Councilor Bartley, who wishes to Yeah, I'm just gonna, motion. I'm just gonna make a, well, first of all, I, I think it's a really um, great attempt by Diosdado. So thanks, Diosdado, for, for putting this out there. I, I, I jotted down f five more intersections. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I think you, I really, really appreciate you doing this. And you're, you're trying to do it, I think, in a fair and, and you know, humane manner. I really think you are. So um, and then, Mike, I appreciate your, uh, you know, your efforts to um, come up with some ideas, a little bit, a little innovative. I mean, I, I'd like to do a try one intersection instead of having all these eight or nine. That'd, that'd be my take on it. Instead of having, you know, let's try one or two, maybe. I agree um, with that. Okay. And then just see how it goes. Let, yeah. let, let, let the chief know and let Probably. his, uh, I'll let his team know with uh, and at BHN, that crisis intervention behavioral team chief. That's you and Captain Feeball. I mean, you guys are usually on it, and you're on it again. So thanks, guys, for staying on point. Um, and then just for right now, Madam Chair, if, if we could, if I, I'd like to make a motion to suspend the rules, allow the a couple of people from the public, not like, you know, and if we're going to allow the public to speak, you know, like 60 to 90 seconds, this not we love to hear from the public. Don't think we don't. But it's a twenty five <laughs> item agenda and we think we're on number three. So we're just, just kinda wanna yeah, move it along if we could, ladies and gentlemen. But so th my motion is to allow the uh suspend the rules, allow the public to address us on this issue, but to keep it to within a reasonable ninety to you know, ninety seconds or so. That's fine. Let's second that. All in favor? Aye. 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 So if you are I'd like to, I was on Oh, Councillor so. Jordan. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and after Councilor Jordan, then I'll open it up. Thank you. Yeah, happy, always wonderful to hear from the public on any and all topics. Um, and for those, again, who could not be here, um, you know, again, John Q. Public, who I painstakingly attempt to uh, represent here uh, to the best of my human ability. Um, many of them are dismayed. Uh, many of them have perhaps a less tolerant view than you know, the formerly homeless or actively, you know, using drug folks that are out there. Um, I will say that citizens that I speak to um, are very concerned about their property values. They're very concerned about the type of community, the message that this sends in. We have, a, you know, a national problem with drugs. We have a national problem with homelessness. They're, we're not going to solve this in this forum, Lord knows. Um, and hopefully we can continue to tackle that. I will say this, the United States of America is the most generous nation in the world when it comes to charitable giving for people. I mean, the billions, billions of dollars the government spends to help people that are down on their luck uh, in the safety net. Um, it's always 
going to be some group that says you're not doing enough. You know, there's never enough. It's insatiable. It's it's uh, you know there there's only a finite amount of money that the United States government can spend on the plenary of of social causes that exist out there. But as a general rule, I don't. I think if people took a fair and objective view on the amount of money government spends uh, to support individuals who are down on their luck, I think they would find that uh, we're more generous than, than most any other nation. So back to the problem that we have at hand, which is this, in, this uh, cadre of individuals who um, sit out in our medians and are conversing with our motorists I'm, I am concerned about safety issues related to that. I think it sends a horrible visual coming into the city of Holyoke. You know, here I am, I'm driving through town uh, from who knows where, and I come into 391, and I got Mr. Vagrant here asking me for money. Okay, and then I go up the street, and I got vagrant number two asking me for money. Then I go up to the next light, and I got vagrant number three. And I'm sorry, but you know, many people would view that um, I'm a, not an incompassionate person because I view that as less than appealing, less than an appealing view at the community that everybody's got their cardboard sign out. It makes the city of Hoyle look horrible. Admittedly. You know, we can use the argument that says misery loves company, that other communities have this same problem, but there's lots of communities that don't have it. So we have an, an, an objective to do it two ways. Fix the grand systemic problem of society, which is what do we do to help every person in the world, um, which there's always, you know, I mean, you've had the poor since biblical times, right? I mean, even Jesus' famous quote that said, you know, the poor you will always have with you, right? I mean, this, this is an age-old thousands and thousands and thousands of year problem. There's always people down on their luck um, for a variety of reasons. But what I want to deal with is address the finite issue of, the, say, 20-ish people who are sitting out at these intersections, and then the question is, what is the most effective mechanism to do that? I like the idea here that's approached of the trial balloon of take a couple intersections that this is at and put certain physical barriers that people are at these intersections that shouldn't be, whether it's uh, guardrails, whether it's uh, small low fencing, uh, whatever, bushes, uh, whatever the case may be, we need to do something to keep these people off these intersections and off of these locations uh, to help them move along so that it's, um, they'll find another place to go uh, do their business, maybe in Chickabee, Springfield, wherever they want to go and be. But that's one approach. I've yet to hear solutions that are better than that. Thinking we're going to go up and shake everybody's hand and pat them on the back and say, I know, you know, times are tough for you and, you know, and we're going to get you into a program and now we hear we're going to get people jobs. We're going to actually go out and the city government is going to now start getting these people, this 20 group of people, we're going to go out and get them jobs. Uh, you know, uh, Houston, we have a serious problem. If the, anybody thinks that's actually going to happen, um, so and Lord knows how much that would cost, and, and what to what job? I, there's a litany of people that are looking for employment already that aren't on the corners. So I would like us to really peel back the the emotions of the issue and look at what can we do to keep these people. And I'm willing to listen to any viable alternative. Off of these medians, uh, we have the pictures. You know, you have a median strip that's about three feet wide, running down 50 Hoyoke Street in front of the Hoyoke Mall, right? Should people be standing there? No, right? No. And I don't care what you're there, if you got a banjo and you're singing, you know, who knows what, or you're there shaking down people in cars. I don't think anybody should be standing there all day with a cardboard sign for, or a banjo or shooting off fireworks, whatever they're doing. That, tell me, if they don't like the, if some in the room don't care for putting up a three foot or four foot fence uh, to keep people off the median, then what's the solution? What's your solution? Because that's unacceptable. 
Okay, that's unacceptable. And my, my citizens of Holyoke think it's unacceptable. They, they're disheartened about the lack of action. They appreciate the fact that there's this free speech barrier. Because actually, I think if we really put it to a ballot and people could vote and we had no constitutional issues at play, they would just say ban panhandling in Holyoke, period, right? I, I bet 50% plus one of this community would vote at a referendum to ban panhandling. It's not legal. We can't ban it. I'd be the first to pass an ordinance to do that if I could, but I can't because it's not legal. So we have to come up with these where these are no longer speech issues, these are safety issues. And within the confines of the law of allowing us to do that, saying people can't go interspersing and sit at medians all day long, I would argue that is fully legal for us to do because it's content neutral. It's not anything to do with what they're doing or saying whether it's begging for money, selling carnations, playing a banjo, whatever they possibly, anybody could be doing on the medians, there is no public, viable public purpose to be standing on these medians interrelating with motorists walking in between cars and Lord knows what, or asking people to roll down their window to hand you money. There is no valid public purpose to do that. So, offer solutions. Saying we're going to create a new work program in Holyoke to get these people in and we're going to run around with a van and pick everybody up and bring them to programs, don't think that's going to happen. Okay? I don't think that's going to happen because you can go do that, great, but the folks that are out there, there, there is so many programs that are out there that are all over. There is a, there's a plenary of things for people to go do. Certain people do not choose to avail themselves of help. Okay, so, and no matter how much do-gooding certain individuals, you know, want to want to have, so I see this as a viable alternative. I'd like to hear what's better than this. I've yet to hear the solution to keep people off medians. Other than that, thank you. Thank you, members of the public. If you wish to speak, come to the microphone. Give us your name and address, please. Be brief. This is not a public hearing, but the committee has voted us. for folks to be heard. <laughs> That's why we get the you ball. elected us. What can I say? <laughs> <laughs> but um, but please feel free to come up um, and make your comments. Good evening, Councilors Juan Sanchez, Ten Gay House Road. So I'm here to speak on uh, two orders in front of you today. The first one is uh, in favor of Councillor Lopez's order on panhandling. However, I'm very perturbed and disturbed with the strategies that have been presented today and some of the wording. I do want to say that other communities have similar orders where they charge a fee for people to panhandle. Boston does it. Northampton does it. Two great big cities are considered progressive and open-minded have panhandling permits. To me, this isn't an issue in which it's a uh, left versus right, a political issue. I also want to speak to the businesses of High Street who I've spoken to while reaching out. Every single business owner on High Street, when I've asked them what's their major issue, is the panhandling in front of their store and restaurant. That people will not go into their restaurants and their stores because as soon as someone gets into the car, or gets out the car, you got a dollar, you got a quarter, you got 50 cents, it's, it's affecting our businesses as well as our residents. And I'm very concerns specifically for businesses down here that are already struggling to keep their doors open, that are already struggling to maintain their livelihoods and what that looks like. Am I okay with people who are struggling asking for help and asking for funds? Of course, but I also want to be clear that this idea of barriers on the side of the highway will just push more panhandlers onto High Street. They're not going to go anywhere. They're just going to go to somewhere that's not a barrier. It's, you know, and it's going to increase that issue. But I do want to, you know, I believe that the idea of a, maybe a panhandling charge for a permit is probably the best way. And uh, I believe that police enforcement upon that would be the best way. But what the police do with that, I don't believe they should send them to prison. I believe that the person's an addict, perhaps you can bring them to a program instead of prison. It's a lot cheaper for the taxpayers to put somebody in rehab than it is in prison for a year. You know, if they want the help, offer the resources. I think police enforcement on top of the order would probably be the best way to, you know, to detour the panhandlers in the area. 
so they know that if you're standing here, you're going to get picked up. We're not going to put you in jail, but we are going to tell you you have to leave and also offer resources when you do get picked up. So not just pick them up and put them in jail, but say, you know, here's a list of rehabs. So you need to get put in a, maybe we have a resource officer who will call rehab programs and services for the individuals who are getting picked up on the corners of uh, the street or whatnot, asking for uh, funds. Although, once again, I understand that some people really do go through it and really need the help, and I'm okay with helping everyone and anyone. I'm notorious for giving my last dollar to pain handlers all the time without thinking twice, because that's just me, but yeah, it is an issue. I think about these businesses down here that are already struggling, Latino business owners that are struggling to keep their doors open, and the fact that the panhandling, although I understand these people need help, is affecting people who also need help. And we can't pick and choose who we want to help and when. We got to make the best decisions. That's going to be the best for the city and its residents and businesses. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Would anybody else like to come up? Well, anybody, he's good. Everybody will have a chance. Hi, my name is Ed Prestis. I live at 49 Elmwood Avenue. I just wanted to bring up the fact that you guys have neglected Northampton Street and the bottom of Northampton Street and the bottom of Whiting Farms Road. That's a real bad spot for panhandling. And the guys there, you got to understand something about the panhandlers. They're organized. They're organized in Northampton. They're organized here. I see the same guys shifting, shifting. And my friend talked to someone in Northampton, a panhandler in Northampton, and they said that we're organized. We go to one guy and he tells us where to go and what to do. I've got a panhandler. You all feel they're homeless. I got a panhandler who lives on my street. He lives on the street. I see his bike. I see his car. He goes up there. He just goes out and he panhandles every day. It's the same people. And my neighborhood, for instance, I don't know if, if the panhandlers have caused this or not, but since they've come to my neighborhood, there's been a, a b and I mean, and, and, and the B&E is like, it was, it was like at 6 o'clock in the evening when it just started to get dark. They broke into this guy's house. They went upstairs. They found him upstairs in bed, and they said, Hey, man, you got two bucks for me? And then when he couldn't get out of bed because he's 90, they just robbed him. They did some cars. Now, I don't know who this is, or maybe I'm just lumping it all together, but they're bringing a bad look to our area. You want a solution for those things that were, where your sign is? Dave um, and the road eliminate those just take them up and put the road there we can figure it out we got signs there's two, one at the bottom of Whiting's Farm Road one on the corner of Northampton and Whiting's Farm those are medians that don't have to be there anymore they were there but now they're being used by panhandlers just take them out and put a stripe there put a sign up the, the fire department's up on Whiting's Farm Road imagine them coming down now we're supposed to be watching out for distracted driving you're complaining about people texting like Rebecca is now and uh, you're complaining about that but another distracted driving is someone coming down the street and someone standing in the middle of the road with a sign you're reading a sign you're gonna hit somebody you, you can't you have to kind of stop that type of distracted driving can you imagine a fire truck coming down going down a Brown Avenue where the fire was and seeing someone on the side of the road it's distracted driving. You got to do something about it. You can't just let them stand there. I got a whole bunch of stuff, but you guys got so much stuff. It was great. Oh, one guy has a sign how his daughter lost all she had on the Brown Avenue fire. What that has to do with him, I don't know. But he's standing there holding a the sign saying, "My daughter lost everything in the Brown Avenue fire." Yeah, he he made it up. He wasn't there. Yeah, and he then, was he wasn't a tenant. That was a total fabrication. Yeah, and the, and, the, and then there was total a, fabrication. There was another guy at Stop and Shop that was holding a sign up that said, "Some this money's going to the family that had some, the fire in the flats." <laughs> How much money you figure went to those people? You know. Thank you, thank you, sir. Thanks, Ed. Right. Thank you. I got to get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. So do we. Yeah, hello, my name is Radimus Lopez. Um, my thing is, um, I'm just, I'm just forcing, um, putting an opinion out there um, with the barrier thing. Now, what you're gonna do when these guys got nowhere to go to ask for that money with that car? But what you're gonna do when they're breaking into houses, robbing people, and going? Put them in jail. 
Yeah, but now you're just bringing the crime rate up instead of just helping their mom keep neglecting them. Uh, can you give us your address, please? 13 Brenner Street. Thank you. Hold it up. So my thing is, we just can't simply keep neglecting them and calling them animals. You're just setting berries and keep neglecting them now. With what the chief was saying over here, putting a website up and all that, from my opinion and what I've been going through on Facebook, people simply just don't care. So if you got a, a website or whatever it is, people ain't going to call it because they don't care. They're obviously trying to force this, order, this ordinance to set the barriers up. So now my thing is, why, why just keep neglecting them and trying to force them on? They're obviously addicts, and I have gone around in the past week so, and talked so to So what's your people. solution? What's your solution? My solution is trying to come up with some type of resources to help these people instead of just keep neglecting them. Come up with a with a program or something. Um, reach out to them. Be a mentor to them, son. If you just keep neglecting them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. We appreciate those. Another thing is though, with the website thing. Today was the first time. Well, I actually a few days ago I found out about the the needle hotline. So you got got to advertise that better if you want want that to work. Thank you. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Is there anyone else who wishes to be heard? Hi, my name is Carmen Ocasio. I'm the president of the South Holyoke Neighborhood Association in Holyoke. I live at 586 South Summer Street. In my community, um, down Main Street, going on the highway to three, 391, um, there's two people there. They're, I guess they're a couple, and they're always there. I stopped and gave some McDonald's to the young lady, and I asked her why she was asking for money. If she needed somewhere to live or something of that nature, she needed any resource. I know that they are addicted, you know, but they're also homeless. Um, they live under the bridge, you know. I took time out to talk to her, you know, and um, we don't have it that's bad in San Holyoke as everywhere else. <laughs> that's what I just, you know, found out, you know. We, I only got two down there, thank God, you know, but... <laughs> Um, I would go bonkers if there, if there was a lot of them. But, you know, um, some of the Carmen, people, just come up to the, come up to the know, mic. I don't, Carmen, walk up to the mic. I, I think that um, it's hard to get an individual to, you know, ask them what are they need, you know, because it, a lot of people got jobs and it take a lot of resource. But I think that by asking them why are they doing it, and what type of help they might need. And if we have the help, you know, help them out, you know, because some people don't know about a lot of resources, trust and believe, because I just learned all these resources as I go along as a volunteer. Hmm. So, and every resource that I'm, you know, that I hear about, I give it to the public too. So maybe helping them out, I don't know, you know, but not everybody, or just asking for money for drug, that's what I'm saying, you know. But 75% are, but that 25% are not, you know, so not everybody are the same. Mm -hmm. And for the gentlemen here, they are just, uh, you know, humans as animals. That was uh, very appropriate. And I think that he owes an apology, an apology to everyone in here because we are human, you know, and we all feel. Rather, you're in, you know, you're up above and you're right there and you have everything, but there's other people. Once you're on the top, you can take that big dip. You know, you never know in life. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, what is the pleasure of the committee? May, Councilor uh, Lopez. Oh, no. Oh, 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 I'm sorry. I'm going to help the other side. Last month, when I was down at KFC, I Name pulled in. Name and address, in. please. Oh, I'm sorry. Wayne Kling, 22 Dale Street. When I was last month, when I was at, uh, they're not all homeless, helpless, because last month when I pulled into KFC, and I was walking across the parking lot to go into KFC, there was an older gentleman, got off of his scooter that's about four or $5,000 worth of money, took off his $200 helmet, took off his leather jacket, had his holy pants on and his shirt that was dirty. He took his stuff and put it into his thing, walked down with his sign, and when I left KFC, it was standing there with his homeless sign saying that I'm homeless and I need some help. So it's not all the people that are homeless. It's both types. 
my suggestion would be the permit system. It doesn't have to be expensive. You put a permit, they have to carry a sign on them, hook it around their neck, it's there, that they have a permit to be there. If it's not in visible sight, the police that drive by, it, or a, a local, anybody that's driving by has the police department number, can call it in and say, hey, if you have a problem, that's the way to handle it. If they're homeless, there are programs in this city to take care of it. There's a lot of churches and stuff. There's, there's other programs. There's social programs. It's getting them to them. It, there are. If you ask for it, you have to ask for it. Asking for money to go get drugs, I understand that there's things there. But you have to go. You have to ask. And some people need help. I'm not saying that they don't need help. But there are a lot of them that are also out there just doing it for the free cash. Thank you. Seems, seems like they're very attuned at asking for help, just not for motorists. You know. I would like to make a motion that I would like to try your idea and see how I just want to don't go crazy spending a lot of money, uh, just go easy, because I, I don't think it's going to work. But I mean, we can try one. And we can try the fencing in other location and see, uh, like, for example, handing and um, handing and 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 handing and Northampton Street. I'm pretty sure the fencing will work beautiful there, off to the driveway. People will not be able to go on the street, or the or the entrance to the mall. Either one, but I would like to try one with the fencing and and see how that will work. Thank you. Thank you. So. Oh, no, no, Gary wants to talk. So. Well, I, I can wait. To, I can wait. No, that's fine. Hang on a second. I, I was just going to uh, talk about intersections where we could try different uh, different procedures, but I'll so defer to Gary. To start with two or three? That would be best. Try. Yeah, sample. Yeah. Okay. Gary Rome, 150 Whiting Farms Road. I don't want to uh, go into the... Uh, a long commentary about this because I do understand that some people need help, but I also do see because I've seen the same people on 391, the boyfriend and girlfriend, and I feel terrible for her. I mean, I see her; she's sunburned, and then she's she she's got she's without a coat, and then I see her with a coat, and I do know that other people know how to work the system, and they really don't need any any funds. But I also think it's a it's a terrible representation of our city, and for me personally, you know, as a business owner who's, who's invested in the city. I'm up the street from the Hoyoke Mall. They get 19 million car visits a year to that location. I just rebuilt the island on the corner over there. I adopted that island. I didn't like the way it looked, so we rebuilt that island. And if you're going to select one location and you do select the Hoyoke Mall, I'd be happy to contribute and help beautify that area there. I don't like the look of Jersey barriers or fences or anything, but if we can do something to beautify that area, we have to make it less appealing for them to panhandle because I know the number on the street is about, I've heard it's about $180 a day that each one of these panhandlers clear. So it's more, I don't think they want to stand outside in the burning, you know, in, in, in the heat or the cold. It's certainly, the, there's other things they'd rather do and they probably have some issues that need to be addressed. But when they can take or earn, not easily, earn $180 a day tax-free, what's the alternative for them? And they don't have to work every single day, right? They can just go out there when it, when it's necessary for them. So I, I, I see both sides of the issue, and, and if somebody was going to start a campaign to try to help these individuals, I'd be happy to contribute to that campaign also. So I'm, I'm, I'm willing to help in any way possible. Thank you, Councilor. Yeah, Gary, so always. Yeah, you can take me for my word. Uh, Gary, yeah. You take me for my word. Awesome. Okay. Uh, yeah, Gary, thanks for, for those two offers, and hopefully the city official will take you up on it. Can I just ask you, this, what was that stat about the, this is off topic, the stat about the number of cars to the mall? 19 million car visits a year to the Holyoke Mall. Okay, and that's, wow, I, I, you know, I, that's, an that's an astounding that's accurate. number. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Thank you. So, I, <laughs> so is the, there a motion that someone would like to well, offer? Can I just make continue one with the discussion. Councilor, I'm sorry. 
I'd like to make one final comment before we wrap it up. Okay. I, think, so, I think Sully wants to make a comment too. Yeah, hold on. Yeah. I, I think you're right. Councillor Jordan. All right. Um, I like the notion of trying a couple different approaches. Um, one is if certain ones you think you really could do it with the shrubbery, I'm willing to defer to your expertise if you really think you can pull it off. A couple of these, and again, um, I think you could do something um, very aesthetic. For example, we have a beautiful Civil War monument in the middle of formerly known as Hamden Park, now known as Veterans Park, right up the street here. And what is around the great statue of um, honoring the Civil War dead? A fence. Okay? A very beautiful iron fence that goes around. Why? Because we don't have people walking up there, right? And it does a remarkably good job. So it's about, I don't know, maybe three and a half feet high. And there's fences come in all nice of designs and shapes and, and sizes. You could have something that looks pretty nice at one of these intersections um, that you know, around um, the median on 50 Hoyoke Street, as a for example, maybe something, it doesn't even have to be terribly high, you know, something maybe even two and a half, three feet high. I think you should try that approach as well in not, just do one. Just do one and see what impact it has. Do your shrubbery approach at a couple different ones and if somebody can get the resources, Gary's loaded. He'll 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 <laughs> under he'll underwrite the van and, and give everybody and jobs at Gary Rome Hyundai and, and and do all of that. And you know, you put all those put all those together and, and, and we've got we're we're home free. So, you know, I think it's a multifaceted approach. It's just at least we're doing something. We're also showing the citizens who see this every day, the business owners. Um, people being approached, at, you know, it, it, we didn't even talk about stopping shops and all these. I mean, literally, you go to the store, oh, uh, I lost my wallet, I ran out of gas. Uh, I mean, it, it's, it's annoying. It, it's constant. It, it, it's, and it's affecting the quality of life of the community. We've got to do something. You know, you go to a, a self-serve gas station, I just ran out of gas, you know, blah, blah, blah. I mean, I, by the way, I just have, I went over to Rogers, which I love for ice cream, and, and Willa Manson. I got some lady coming across the street, doesn't even have a car, right? And I said to my son, who was standing next to me, I said, get a load of this one, right? Here she comes, and she's about to ask me for money, right? And I'm standing there waiting to order my ice cream cone. So this is the stuff that's driving people nuts. We need to be proactive as leaders to do something about it. So that's my comment. I think it's a multifaceted approach. I heard a lot of great things. Thank you, everyone, for their help. Councilor Lisi. Thank you. Um, I think that creating, creating the jobs campaign or the program in which the homeless folks are helping to beautify the median. It sounds like a perfect opportunity to marry, you know, the needs that we have in the city for maintaining perhaps the parks and the fences um, around the Civil War monument that you're talking about. And then also, like, the, the, adopt a, the Adopt an Island program has not been very effective overall. That's why we have individuals coming along and um, beautifying uh, islands on their own as opposed to through the Adopt a, the Island program. And... I know by me in um, the Smith Ferry area, half of those medians are overgrown. There's there's weeds. They're not really well maintained. So it just seems like the the perfect type of program to to service the needs that we have in the community to you know maintain the medians, create a median program, and bring the panhandlers in for um, you know several hours a day and give them meaningful opportunities um, for work. Uh, I think I don't think that it is pie in the sky mentality. Um, if we could create a fund and a campaign, um, you know, if we could direct some of the the resources that are going to the panhandlers directly into a fund and a campaign to support these um, alternatives, uh, I think that's again more sustainable way to approach the the, the situation. Thank you. Thank you, um, Councillor Sullivan. Yeah, I will try and say this in a kinder and gentler way. Um, everything we've discussed and we've been discussing now uh, for months and months and months is, is directed at the panhandlers themselves and as we all know there are loads of programs out there but they're refusing them they're not participating we need to educate the public 
also. We're not, we're putting up barriers to the panhandler, shrubs for the panhandlers, sign for the panhandlers to stop it. We've got to make it, and this is part of the thing, making it more difficult for them. But it's the public that continue, that needs education also. And we ought to spend, if we're going to spend money on barriers, if we're going to spend money on rose bushes or whatever, we ought to spend some money trying to educate the public as well. If you make it more difficult for them, and this is another tool for making it more difficult, educating the public not to give them money, it will it will force more people to consider getting into the programs that exist to help them. Thank you. And that brings us full circle because at the beginning of this discussion, that is exactly what our chief brought to us as one of the big um, considerations as we try to address this complex matter. So I want to thank everybody who's come and weighed in, and I'd like to hear from a um, member of the committee if there's a motion on this matter. Like I stated before, I, um, I would like to table the order, allow Mr. Mike to come back with some proposal, maybe you're ready by now, and see how this is going to work. Uh, I think if we can, throw, I, I would like to see three or four intercession that we try, uh, unless well, you are ready for this. So now. is that a motion that, that you that's would like motion. him to yes. proceed with three or four intersections with a variety of approaches? Uh, absolutely. I is think there the, a second for that? Second. Uh, I, under discussion, Councilor Bartley? Yeah, I just make a friendly amendment to make it like one or two, Diosato, only because because I, I want to make sure, Councilor, that the uh, that the police is that okay, Councilor? So to so make it like two, is that okay? Yeah. So I, three. Three. He suggested. All right, right in the middle. So that's Mike, you're a politician. That's great. So mm -hmm. keep it right, right in the middle. Okay. So I'll make the motion. I have it three intersections, and and then you coordinate with the the, uh, the, the chief and Captain Feebo on their team, mm -hmm. and then maybe report back to this committee or in uh, in the fall, Chief. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have a motion before us. Councillor Sullivan. If, if we're going to do this, like I said, we're going to try a barrier, we're going to try this. Couldn't the police department also try a public notice in the paper informing and educating the public as to what they're doing when they contribute to the problem? No, I, I, and I think your point is well taken. And, Chief, I believe you touched on this early on, which is, the human instinct is to help our fellow man, as we all articulate it. But, but I think you correctly point out that you're really not helping. You're actually enabling. And um, it's turning them away from going to get the other things. With this, we would like um, to see if your department or in whatever resources you can uh, reach out with or if you could one of your troops could uh, give some leadership too is to you know uh, may, uh, expand the public presence of explaining to the public it is not in the best interest of, of the citizenry to be giving donations that this is a problem that we're trying to work through and we want these folks to get help and this is not helping and if we do that we do these three things and then for those who are the very civic minded uh, over here, you know, if we can get people, uh, you know, do whatever they can to take people in or give them jobs and all these other multiplicity of things, rides to programs. Is that um, an amendment? Yeah, that is an amendment that we also do this public education campaign for the citizens as well as, you know, give our. Okay. If there's something in the community, a resource that we can also do. Yeah, I'll, I'll second that because okay. I think the chief raised a good point about the, the, the I website. I think that needs to happen simultaneously. So we have a motion before us to do three intersections with various approaches and to Beautiful. the extent that you have resources to do some public service announcements. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries. Thank you very much. This is a difficult and challenging matter. We need to balance the needs of people who have serious problems and the people who are trying to be entrepreneurial and do business in Holyoke because we want to be business friendly too. So. Oh. So. Oh, okay.
Okay. Okay, so I've um, had a technical correction that we have all voted to include the amendments that you heard, and so now I'll entertain so I'll, I'll a, motion. Make a motion. I'll make a motion to uh, adopt this as amended. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank no. you. And one opposed. Joy to the world. And uh, can we make a motion and now to take item five off the table, which is uh, yeah. related? Do I have a second? Second, yeah. All in favor? Aye. Aye. So item five Which filed. Which was addressed by some in the room. I filed. It was addressed in the public hearing portion or the public speak portion. Um, I filed this order last year. Ordered that any person or group soliciting money from the public on city property must obtain a permit from the police department prior to any solicitation. The permit shall remain in effect for a time designated by the police chief for up to one year. Now, at the time that I first brought this order forth, there were legal concerns about the ability to do this activity. It's been found that the activity is allowed, but it also appears that in that time frame, there have been cities who have actually implemented a permit process for this activity, which have been found to be legal um, and are currently being used. Okay, so um, I'll, make a, I'll make a motion to adopt this and to you want to put in legal form, Linda, or set up? The, the well, my first question was, is this legal? And Chief, is there, uh, it was alluded to earlier that other communities might be doing this, that <laughs> if I'm a panhandler, I can, I, I'm required to come down and get a panhandler permit from the police chief. Um, do you know for a fact that that's happening in other communities? What do you think about this? Since I do not know for a fact, but we were given two communities, Northampton and Boston tonight. I would ask to go back and take a look and see what they've done before we take action on that in this okay. direction. All right, so that, seems, that seems wise. Because I, I just, uh, you know the litigation that's happened. Yeah. You know what's happened with Worcester. They, they just got lost a $519,000 judgment to the ACLU on some issues they had on panhandling. Not permitting process, but some issues that they had right. and they had to pay attorney fees. So I, I, right. I, I, I want to tread carefully before we... Oh, yeah. And my other request that's, that's my was, well. based on the other discussion under the other order, was, is in keeping with that to see the other communities who have less of an issue with this um, along with the permitting process, what other things they might be doing that we could use as best practice. I mean, maybe they have some other ideas that we haven't aired tonight. So you know, that might yeah, yeah, be yeah, helpful as As I'm well. inquiring about their ordinances, I can certainly inquire yeah. whatever. Could, could I recommend that we refer it to the chief and the law department to give us a, if there's these other communities that we get a draft law as a sample for the mm -hmm. committee to consider and then at that point we can uh, take next steps at least we could go through the language and by then you'd have an opportunity to research to see has it been tested anywhere and take it from there is there a second on second that that, yeah, second Councilor Lisi under discussion thanks um, so when I did door-to-door -door canvassing for clean water action there um, we would have to get permits um, for soliciting um, in West Hartford, Connecticut. So that would be another oh, model good. to look at. West, West Hartford, Hartford, Connecticut? I, uh, th I would be cautioned about going across the line. Uh, I'm more concerned about Massachusetts law. In Connecticut, they have um, a statute, a motor vehicle statute, reckless use of the highway by a pedestrian. Somebody steps in the road, you just write them a ticket. <clears throat> it's a state ticket, and you're done. Uh, so so I, I, just, I just caution crossing the line. Sure. But I, don't, I, I think I just want to highlight two, two things about my experience. Um, number one, there was no cost. Um, so if there's going to be any fee, um, I'm not going to support, um, you know, any sort of licensure or, or um, yeah, licensing. Uh, and then additionally, um, so there was no fee, and then it was called um, a permit to solicit so I don't want to create any sort of stigma as if, you know, the, the work that you're doing when you're going door to door for your church or getting, you know, money for gift wrap for the, you know, whatever, you know, youth program is going to be identified differently from panhandling because it's all soliciting and it's all protected free speech. Um, so if we're going to do one, if we're going to create a, a permit for one, we're doing a permit for the other. So all solicitation, we're not going to differentiate panhandling from other sorts of free speech uh, solicitation of funds. Thank you. And to be clear, my order states any person or group soliciting money. 
Right. It's not aimed at any particular group, person, right. or anything of that sort. No, so um, I think, we I think have it's a motion before us. I to... think it's important, Madam Chair, to emphasize that these things that we're doing, again, are content neutral. Right. You know, to meet the legal standard, that's what it has to be. You have to treat restrictions on speech in a content neutral manner. So the law department was out of the room at the time, but the proposal on the table, uh, Crystal, is to take item five, refer it to you and the chief so that uh, there's some model laws in other cities in Massachusetts to give us a draft back with, with uh, those, if you could take a look at it. And Northampton and Boston, I believe, were specifically named. Thank you. So we have a motion before us. Is every all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion carries 5-0. Thank motion you. Motion to proceed out of order, suspending necessary rules, and go to 21, filed by uh, Councillor McGee. Good night, Councillors. Thanks Thank a lot. Appreciate much. your help. We appreciate your feedback. Thank you. Very helpful. Do I have a second? Second. Second. Yep. All in favor? Aye. Item 21, filed by Councillor McGee. Whereas new businesses that have developed around the mall area are looking for better directional signage for their business and such signage could be placed on private property owners' property, it is therefore requested that the Ordinance Committee consider the following as a possible new ordinance. The ordinance that is written before us is a non-accessory sign ordinance. Now I'm going to read through it, but before I do, I want to let the folks here, that are here for it know that I've been advised that we have to do advertising in a public hearing because even though some portions of it may have been ordinance because it does affect zoning, we have to go through that uh, process. I'll, I'll, I'll make a motion to do an abbreviated reading on, on this. Second. It's really Second. Likely. All in favor? Aye. Aye. So under abbreviated reading, this would create a non-accessory sign ordinance. It would allow certain signage um, within the BH zone um, and there are a number of other stipulations around size, height, location. Um, it would be from a quick reading restricted to the BH zone. Um, and beyond that, we will get into more details with a full presentation of it. Uh, my understanding and Crystal, come correct me if I'm mistaken. We need to advertise for two weeks prior. Okay, thank you. So we will advertise it and bring it forth um, in a timely manner to move ahead with it. Okay, just Matt, Matt, point of order, Madam Chair. Councilor uh, Bartley. Okay, this order is really lengthy. So to advertise this, Okay, so if we can avoid the draft language, that would be great because you're looking at a. I think that's for your benefit, not for the actual. Yeah, benefits and quotes, right? Okay. <laughs> okay, as long as everybody's comfortable with that, we will be doing a, a public notice that states, in essence, that we would be creating a non accessory sign ordinance, if I'm hearing you correctly. Correct. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So, so we, um, on that matter, I just would ask for it to be tabled till the public hearing. Can, oh, you don't want to have any discussion on this, Madam Chair? Well, we can't. We have to advertise We have that. to have a public hearing. So whatever we do here would have to be redone yeah. there. But I wanted to make sure that we all had the language before us. Well, I mean... So I, I guess Councilor I would, Barley, if you wish yeah, to... Well, I was just going to say, I sure. mean, we, we've got, I think, one of the advocates here... I wouldn't mind suspending the rules for like three minutes maximum if you want to just give us a Reader's Digest version of what it is you want to do. Do I have so, a second? Yeah, second. So, all, all in right. favor? Aye. We need to Aye. suspend the, the rules. Yeah, I, that was my motion. I suspended the rules. Mm, under suspension of rules. So, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Good evening, or good morning. Good evening. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Attorney Thomas Wilson, 18 Carter Street, Hoyoke, Mass., and I'm representing Gary Rome. What we're trying to do is allow Mr. Rome and other businesses who are investing in Hoyle to be able to put up a sign 
on a property that's not theirs. Right now, that's against the ordinance in the city. And I helped craft the ordinance, and I did it in a way where my first thought was, it's great, but we have to make sure that these signs look good, stay looking good, and are um, not going to look trashy or anything like that. And one of, the, one of your fellow counselors, when I first brought it up to him, said, well, how do you stop somebody from putting eight signs on their empty property? And I said, you've got to limit it. Um, and the other thing is the BH zoning. If the council if, wants to adopt this and make it citywide, we have no problem with that. That's, that's your decision. We just want to be able to do like in other cities and towns. I looked at Springfield. I looked at Everett. I looked at Attleboro, Worcester, and now I'm forgetting the last one. And they all have these accessory signs, which are signs that are on property other than the business owners. And all those towns, by the way, my last thing I'm going to say is make a huge differentiation between that and a billboard. Okay. Thank you. And I think I saw somewhere about digital also. And currently, the city prohibits digital signs, although I know from time to time you see one here or there in the city that are out of compliance with our laws, um, except in the situation where a certain exception is made. So um, that would also <coughs> need to be addressed um, within this order if that is the intention, just to make you aware. All right? Yes, thank, thank you. you very much. Thanks, Toby. Um, I just wanted to... Oh, go ahead. You're the boss. Well, thank you. <laughs> oh, and... I was just going to mention one other thing that might be helpful. Um, in, in the mic, Gary. In the mic. Sorry. Gary Rome again, 150 Whiting, Farm, Whiting Farms Road. just want to mention, we created this, this pamphlet here to make it easier for the counselors to, uh, to follow along at what our intention is with this. And just simply... The current ordinance, as Toby alluded to, considers an off-site sign an accessory sign. So that's a sign that is on a property not owned by that individual. And a non-accessory sign is considered a billboard under the current ordinance. And billboards aren't allowed under the current ordinance. So as a business owner in Holyoke looking to grow our business even further, I need to be competitive in the marketplace and have be able to direct people to our location. So if you look, when you get a chance, if you look in here, we've identified the location of this sign. Um, we've obtained a lease with the property owner. And I've also given some examples of what potential uses for the sign would be. So not only to, would the sign be self-serving you know, for, for us to grow our business, but also there's other opportunities to use it to promote the Holyoke St. Patrick's Day Parade, um, celebrate Holyoke. Um, we could utilize it for raising money for different charities, which we've done in the past. Also to alert people of weather, um, amber alerts, missing persons, and, and things like that. We could talk about that further. And my recollection is that the weather alert is the only thing that allows for a digital sign to exist. So if you want digital, then that will need to be addressed in the public hearing as well. Yeah. Okay. It's right, um, it's in front of the, it's on the O'Connell property uh, where the Shell station is. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, thank thanks you. Gary, thanks Toby. Okay. Thank you. Motion to table. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Planning has to be in front. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I just want yes. To I make a motion that we, take, we up take up the traffic ordinances. Hang on a second. Can we take up item 24? There's a lot of people here for that item. 21 and 14, I have requests for prior to 24. We did 21. That was Gary's I, order. 14 and 17. It's just that Mike, Mike had been waiting on those traffic ones. Because that other one's going to probably be a fairly long, a longer case. Okay, so... Okay. Is that the traffic one? It was uh, It was actually nine, okay. 9 through 12, but he said he could punch through them in 5 okay. or 10 minutes. All right. So mo is that a motion to suspend and take up 9 to 12? Second. As a package? Yeah. Sure. Absolutely. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Mike? Sorry, Mike. I didn't realize you were here for... We're going to get you a name plate a couple like others. the rest of us. <laughs> Oh, we're on nine. Eight. 
Oh, I'm All sorry. Right. Uh, so oh, make oh. a motion to add eight to the package. Second. All in favor? Oh. Aye. Aye. So under suspension, we're taking up eight through 12. And Mike is always very well organized, and as usual, he has given us a printed out detailed sheet for each item. So what happens which when you, have, that's, that's, that's what happens when you live in the city. You got, more, you got more time to do stuff like this. Mm -hmm. Less commuting. Yeah, less commuting. Well, let, let's give the so let's, let's, let's eight, suspend the rule. Give the other guy a, read a waiver. Um, filed by Councilor McGee that the city install permanent speed humps on George Foss Drive. Resident petition to be filed. I understand the petition has been properly filed at this time. Uh, so a, a speed study was done with temporary speed humps. They showed that there was a reduction in speed, so speed humps would be recommended. The petition was filed, and I think uh, per the ordinance, section 7857, there needs to be a public hearing and then approval by the full city council. So once that happens, we'll put permanent speed humps in. All right, make okay, a so I'll motion to table this and then uh, schedule, a schedule a public hearing. hearing. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And also uh, attached with what you have is the list of speed hump requests that we have at, at DPW. This is all I can find on record. I'm sure there's others that have been filed since uh, uh, 2012. Oh. Yeah. Well, I just filed one last meeting, Mike, so you can add Macintosh Terrace to it. Okay. And I have one on there, too, for Mountain Road, I think. But this was, I know this was requested from City Council. Thank you. So that's all I have. So item nine, oh, okay. So we have um, tabled eight for public hearing. Item nine filed by Council Bresnahan ordered that DPW install a parking sign for loading in front of 27 Olive Street to allow the bodega on Dwight and Olive to have deliveries to its store. Uh, so this one, uh, we wouldn't have a problem putting a, a loading sign on Olive Street. Um, maybe we could uh, put it close to the corner. All right, motion approved. Put in legal form. If, if, if I could, if I could, and I'll be very, I'll be very brief, my friends. Council President. Um, I just, Mike, the, this uh, bodega in question. There's a, and the owner's here. She could speak to it better than I. But there's actually like a loading dock door, and the bodega's right above about a 16 unit building. Okay. Um, so I just, I, I just want to be clear that you know, I, as opposed to just slapping the sign up on the corner of Olive, if it could be. In front of that door, the backside entrance, is that right? Can I suspend the rules and just give her a minute to, to maybe touch upon this? Why? Well, we're ready to adopt it. We're, we're, we're ready adopt to it, move Danny. forward and approve it. I just want the sign in the right spot, and I don't want I don't want then them squared up with him. Right. Okay. All right. 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 <laughs> all right. Don't put it on my yeah. house. Fine. You're all set. Thanks, Mike. I'll email you. There's an so old expression, if you're winning, stop speaking, right? <laughs> we have a motion before us <laughs> wow. to adopt, and we trust, Mike, that you Forget will work with the owner. Forget makers of law, makers of history, yes. Yeah. Right. Open up the windows, it's getting paint, warm in here. Paint that thing we over. We agree with you, what more? <laughs> I got a, that, that's a better one. <laughs> On the motion, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Awesome. Motion carries. <laughs> Item 10, filed by Councilor Leahy, ordered that the Department of Public Works put up a sign on the existing corner sign approximately 15 yards away from the corner of Cherry and Dale on the even side. The sign shall read, no overnight parking, 9 p.m. to 7 a.m. Uh, so this one, uh, I, what I think is happening is there's overflow parking from Bowdoin Village. Uh, Bowdoin Village is, is currently constructing a parking lot uh, for yes. an additional 28 spaces. Yes. Oh, okay. No, well, no, 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 we didn't ask me. for you to speak. Excuse yeah, me. yeah. So. Uh, just hang on a sec. Hold on. So my so the, so there is a, a parking issue on on Dale Street, and uh, we could put up a no overnight parking sign uh, up Dale, say from here to corner with with Cherry Street. Okay. Well, and, and we and had done hope. that further down Dale a year ago because of the same reason but so it's encroaching all the way to the end I hear you on that Council Bartley okay why don't you just add that to the parking permits because well, I mean what I mean are you gonna have like no overnight parking on this whole 
We already have. So, so Bowen Village is going to, they're, they're, they're building, didn't we, didn't we approve a CDBG grant for them to get the parking? They're, they're constructing more parking. Yeah, because right we, we, we have to so, speak. Right. So hopefully at, at some point in time, once that parking is fully available, there won't be an issue. Right. with this overflow parking onto other side streets. Right, but right now they need that. Right. And maybe we can take the sign down a if year If it's from no now. longer needed. Whatever. All right. Okay. Motion, motion, motion proof. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Item 11, filed by Councilor Bartley, ordered that the City of Holyoke consider lowering the speed limit on Willow Street. Uh, so we did uh, uh, two traffic studies. Uh, the second one was done uh, May 10th to 15th, uh, and the results of that indicated that the speed of traffic was 29 miles per hour, which is lower than the uh, prima facie 30 mile per hour speed limit for the road. That indicates that speeding isn't an, an issue on Willow Street. It's not to say that people don't speed, it's just that Overall speeding is not an issue, and we wouldn't recommend any further traffic calming. No, motion may comply with. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. The motion carries 5-0. Item 12, filed by Councilor McGee, ordered that the speed limit of 30 miles per hour be lowered to 20 miles per hour on Old Ferry Road. Uh, so we did a traffic study May 17th to 22nd, and uh, the study indicated that the speed of traffic was 37 miles per hour which is almost 10 miles per hour greater than the prima facie speed of 30 miles per hour for this road. Uh, given the circumstances of that road, where it is, that it's essentially a dead end street leading to the canoe club, uh, an average speed of 37 miles per hour uh, with engineering judgment is too fast. And we would recommend looking at traffic calming measures such as a speed hump. Uh, but we wouldn't recommend just slapping a 20 mile per hour speed limit sign mm -hmm. uh, because we don't think that will do anything. The speed, the speed hunt limit. would need a, a would hearing and the whole yeah. Can petition you put some temp process. Have you, has there been temporaries put on the street yet at all? Or? Not to my knowledge, no. Okay. Maybe we start there, huh? We could request that as the committee, yeah. can't we? Could you? Could. Yeah. Is that a motion? Yeah, I make a motion that we Back in that motion. do the temporaries and see how that goes. And if necessary, put if that works, then we put the permanents in after our public hearing. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. Oh, we better vote. We, that was just the motion. We, right. On the motion? Aye. Aye. Thank you very much. Well, before he goes. What, we have another one? No, but, I mean, he, 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 he attached this list. Oh. So Hang what, on. What, what's your intention with the list, Mike? I had, I had heard that City Council had requested this list. Oh, thank you. The, the was, mysterious list. The mysterious list. No, I, I copied that. No, I, I, I you know, copied that, but... You need a mic. And so what my... I, I have a mic. Oh, okay. th this is the information that I have. These are. This is what's been requested. Uh, no. there, there might be others. No, that's awesome, Mike. So are, are, are you going to... There are others, uh, which, which we just named two already, but are you going to start putting the... Temporary speed humps out there? We will. Is that, we will. Yeah, okay, oh. that was the answer I was looking for. I have my Ward 6 one here uh, by my predecessors, number one on the list. I'll, we'll be looking forward to seeing that soon. <laughs> As Mike smiles. <laughs> we, have, we have two sets. Mm -hmm. We have two sets of speed temporary speed humps. Uh, we have one uh, uh, traffic radar system. So we would need a, another... Uh, traffic radar oh, thing. What else are we talking about? No, it's a box that we mount on a telephone pole that measures the speed of every car going by. Ward 6, Ward and 6. Actually, I'm 1 and here, 2 and 3 on the, the list. The past orders that have been filed for signs and painting of lines, is that in the queue for spring? Yeah, it's still in the show. queue for work, yeah. Thank you. Oh, and one more question, ma'am, 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 sure. Yeah, yeah, I sent you a text, Mike, about three weeks ago. How we do on the Chapter 90 funds? Uh, we've identified more work than what we have for. So, what's our budget? Nine. That was my question. I sent I sent to you a couple three weeks ago. So, the overall budget is a little bit more than one million dollars, uh, and we can use that for design of improvements. We can use it for equipment, and we can also use it for uh, roadway rehabilitation. So, the milling and filling, uh, overlays and crack sealing. 
our uh, road rehabilitation. Um, there are uh, a couple of design projects that I'd like to use some of the Chapter 90 money on uh, for one is Northampton Street uh, in between Hamden and uh, and Dwight, the, the corridor there with the two intersections, uh, and the other would be Homestead Avenue to look at congestion uh, and see if there's any way that we can relieve congestion there. Um, I'm, I'm developing a plan with uh, a list of the roads that will be rehabbed, and I think within by the end of next week, I'll have that complete. Will you, can, are you set? No. Will you be considering requests from the ward councilors along with your assessment of the roads yeah. in that regard? Yeah. So we should it's make a, sure any ward councilors listening that you have your requests in for their mm -hmm. consideration. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Okay, thank All set. You. Yep. Thank you very much. I make a motion I, to suspend the rules to go to item 24. Uh, that I believe we have some guests waiting okay. for. Okay. Second. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Aye. We have 14 for Dave. Well. Dan. We'll get, we'll get to it after this. I'm just letting you know. All right. Okay, so we have a motion before us to take up item 24. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Item 24, filed by Councilor Roman, ordered that the City of Holyoke, through ordinance, pass the fair chance rule requiring that the city itself as an employer make revisions to its current civil service processes and eliminate any barriers, including the checking of the box during an interview and application process that may preclude applicants with criminal records from gaining employment with the City of Holyoke and or its contractors, giving exception to any employment having to deal with the elderly, finances, and the youth. Council Rome. Yes, uh, Madam Chairwoman, I just checked with some of the members of the colleagues. I know Attorney Carroll, before she had left, had emailed to the committee to you. I was carbon copied on that, the legal language uh, for this, the draft legal language that Attorney Carroll had drafted. So while you're searching for that, and I can get printouts to my colleagues, um, again, and we just had an amazing conversation a couple weeks ago in development and government relations with uh, uh, Sheriff Nick Kochi, uh, and hearing that 70, um, the, the percentage of Holyokers coming out from being formerly incarcerated to the city of Holyoke, 77%, we got some amazing statistics, are Latino. We know that a high percentage of those, three-fourths, are males. Um, they come into this community. They're looking for employment. The sheriff's trying his best to get them employment. Um, but we're trying to send the right message with this language. There are two other municipalities where this draft order and the draft language was pulled from. Uh, both Worcester and the city of Boston have this uh, provision in place. Both the Worcester and Boston provision go extremely forward um, and make it just the law of the land, but I specifically pulled that back and only required the city of Holyoke as an employer and its contractors. All this would do is give the fair opportunity for those who are formerly incarcerated in our city who are coming back as a way to reduce recidivism to be able to get gainful employment within the city of Holyoke. And in the language in Worcester and Boston, it clearly cars out elderly finance or youth um, are exempt from that, and this language would allow, let's say, for example, someone comes and applies, um, they would not have to check that box, which a lot of the times studies have proven deters an employer or human resources or whomever. A lot of times, nine times out of ten, if they have the person who checked that box or didn't, they'll go with the person who didn't. This would allow them a fair opportunity. It does not eliminate the need for courier or background checks, it just comes at a later stage in the process. It allows them to go through that process, and if they do get employment that needs or requires a courier or background check, that happens after an offer of employment is made. And as long as that individual, again, through the interview process or whatever is forthcoming, they get the employment. Um, Worcester has seen success with this, and so has Boston. Um, I would like to see this here in the city of Holyoke, just again as another one of those tools to help those who are formerly incarcerated. And I know we have Holyoke residents here, and I know that when I go down door knocking in South Holyoke, and I actually want to highlight and applaud my colleague to my right, Councilor Sullivan, who a lot of the times his company and his guys that he works with, he gets a lot of those young guys who come out, and his company is the first place. A lot of the times they go and get gainful employment um, down there. And so it's a really good win-win for the city of Holyoke. 
um, and I would just like to be able to see individuals being able to apply for city jobs and contractor jobs with the city of Holyoke, whether that's in construction or employment, and start assisting our all of the residents of the city of Holyoke. So I know Attorney Carroll send that draft language, and I will definitely go and get the copy to you all, but I would like to begin this conversation and allow you all to hear from the residents um, who are interested in this. Thank you. So I can understand the proposal a little better, Councilor Roman. It's um, <clears throat> do we have a copy of the actual Holyoke application for employment uh, that it's being used? I'm, I'd be interested to see how they word the quote unquote the box. Um, is it specifically asking if you've had a prior misdemeanor or felony? It or? says, have you ever been convicted of a felony or crime, and you have to check yes or no. Okay, so uh, convicted of a felony um, or any crime? Crime, yes, just generic, yes. Yeah. Within, within the last five, five years. years yes okay all right so what you would be proposing is so if you were convicted of a felony last week uh that we wouldn't want to know that so what it's proposing is and we've heard this from the sheriff and dgnr if you've come out of the department of the sheriff's department and you've come out you yes you had a mess up in your life you come out you done you've done your time either you're in probation you're out of probation you're done serving your time because as a society that's what we believe and you do you do your time you do your penalty you mm -hmm. come out you are not you would not have to check that if you did your time and you're working with the sheriffs or you're done with probation uh, so it wouldn't require it at that stage it would allow you to go through the interview process and again, it carves out except for elderly, finance, and youth. So if you're working in the school department, you're working with our seniors, you're working, in, let's say, in the finance department. Those you would be required to check automatically, and that's what the provisions in Boston and Worcester have. But for the rest, let's say you want to be a janitor, you want to be a clerk, you want to be whatever, you don't have to check that off at that point. Okay, and so let you me just give you a hypothetical. So I rob a bank, and I stick somebody up with a gun, and I go to jail for two years, and here I come, and now there's a janitor opening in Holyoke. And um, I, you don't feel that that's something that, is it, for, you know, I just want to distinguish between misdemeanors and felonies. There's a big distinction in, in, the, in that. I think you appreciate that. I, I, um, maybe some in the audience don't appreciate that, but, but I'm a lawyer. I appreciate the distinction in the my, law. My thought process on this is, Irregardless if you have done any crime, if you have done your time and you are out of that system, studies have proved... Just anybody who's, never, anybody if, who's out of jail. So, so just to, to give you another hypothetical, let's say I robbed a bank and I did five years in jail. I come out, I want to apply for a job in the city of Holyoke if I've done my time. I've done my probation, or I'm on my probation, yes. I should not have to check that off because I've done my time. That's the point of rehabilitation that's the point of being another productive citizen but why should I be penalized twice if I've done my time to then have to be excluded from a job and that's what's happening and that's what I'm seeing from my constituents well how about this so if I'm the valedictorian of Holyoke High School and I apply for a job and I've done nothing but I did mission work in Guatemala mm -hmm. helping people and I come back uh, for the last five years or candidate number two who has got done robbing a bank and just served the last five years in state prison mm -hmm. okay those two candidates an employer should not consider the relative merits of the two candidates to say okay here's candidate one and here's candidate two this guy is valedictorian of Hoyoke High and did mission work for five years this guy over here stuck up a bank everybody on the floor and he just went to state prison for five years nobody nobody the employer the human resources department of the Hoyle, I just want to understand this should not be able to ca ca compare the two candidates to say which one should be more worthy for employment and let's just say again counselor and excuse me if we could have respect from members I, of the I, audience and speaking to my colleague that's not necessary what I would like to see, Counselor, is that let's say within those five years, because again, we're operating on individual hypothetical situations, right. and to carte blanche say everyone's robbed a bank or murdered someone, when we know the high felonies, I'm just but let's, let's talk about the, the stats that we got from the Sheriff's Department. A lot of these are, yes, they're, they're, they're either minor robberies, there's things like that, they're, and yes, that, that all exists in the spectrum, but let's say in those five years, that individual went, went and got his GED, gets his diploma, while he's incarcerated, yep. right, comes out, still has to 
do community service has to check in. Let's say that valedictorian went to Guatemala, comes back, he's on opioids, he's dealing, he's doing, it doesn't matter what you do in life. <laughs> life doesn't determine what happens when you come home. That valedictorian from Holyoke High can now be one of our panhandlers that we're talking about earlier. You never know. I'm not going to get into the morals of an, like hypothetical situations. What I'm trying to do is say, listen, we have a high rate of formerly incarcerated individuals who have high rates of unemployment. And if we as a city, right, like other cities, major cities with a large unemployment issues, if we have a large constituency, and again, if we talk about the percentages that the sheriff gave us of those individuals who are coming back out of being incarcerated, 86% of those are Latinos. So it's a large portion of Latino men who are without employment. We as a city just need to give them that second chance. And yes, if they come in and let's say within those five years while they're incarcerated, they work with Sheriff Kochi. Sheriff Kochi says, hey, they've done good. They come up with their bachelor's degree. I've seen some of these men and women do really good things. I am not going to, on a generic or hypothetical situation, no, because that person who might have been the valedictorian might not be qualified for the position. And what we're seeing with these orders, it allows individuals who might have gotten the education, the degrees, and the skills necessary to perform functions be looked over, and studies have proven that, because they check one box. And it's not to say that during the interview process their skills don't matter, that the human resources department person might say, well, their skills don't match. But it eliminates one more barrier that they have to go through compared to others who might be in the same position. And that's all I'm trying to do. What I'm trying to distinguish, Councilor. We're debating back and forth, and I'd like to get a word Can in. I, yeah, I have thanks. Somebody in the queue? Yeah, appreciate that. I'm just continuing my point is that I just want to make the distinction so I understand the proposal on the floor is is that thanks but this isn't the peanut gallery but, if that's what you were expecting ma'am ma then you can get that on camera and you can leave this, okay this but is we not don't we don't operate hearing, that way this isn't but, a shouting match but i do have um councilor lisi in the queue you know run for office if you want to have my chair good we'll see you soon november's the election Wait now the the, the point order. the point is that um i want to distinguish the proposal between somebody who gets picked up for a drug possession charge or uh, somebody who has an OUI or, you know, so something like this, which, you know, and then I'm very sympathetic. And in fact, you and I have talked about that before of saying, you know, to condemn that person for it. But I just want to distinguish that between that and people with serious felonies. Uh, I think there's a difference between the two. So anyways, that's my, that was my only point. Thank you. Councilor Lisi. Thanks. Um, first thing I want to say is I think that people that are going to prison for serious felonies aren't coming out in, in five or ten years. Um, they're probably going away for m much longer sentences. Um, second of all, I think that if we really believe in the rehabilitative nature of our prison system, then people go in and they need to come out and have an opportunity to start their life over. Otherwise, we're going to have these incredibly high rates of recidivism, and people are going to resort to crime if they can't find, I'm going to use this term again, I've been using this term all night, meaningful alternatives, meaningful work-based alternatives. If people can't find work and a way to support themselves, they're going to continue to resort to a life of crime and get themselves in trouble, and we're not going anywhere in that situation. Um, Second of all, to just play out this hypothetical that you posed, I think that if you, if you have two candidates, the valedictorian who went on mission work and somebody who um, served time and is now looking for work as a janitor, or whatever the position is going to be, I think the resumes are going to speak for themselves without having to check off a box. This person went to, um, you know, Guatemala did their mission work. They get to talk all about the experiences and good work that they did there. There's no way that they're being, being put at a competitive disadvantage to somebody who doesn't have any work experience for the past five years, six years, ten years. There's no way that they're, they're going to be put at a competitive disadvantage. People that have done time and got their GED while they were in um, incarcerated and they come out and they're trying to start their, they're going to be going after entry level positions for the most part perhaps um, they had some you know specialized skill training uh, trades training while they were in, in prison so I, I don't think that this hypothetical that you're setting up is very realistic at all where we're going to be putting um, people that you know have done it right their whole life um, are going to be a, at a competitive disadvantage to um, people that made mistakes at some point 
It's through, all that I want to put out there for now. Thank you. And Council through the Rowan. chair, I just want to alleviate my colleagues' concerns. This does not eliminate the Cory requirements in the state of Massachusetts. All it does is allow the candidate to come through the front door, not have to check off at that portion of the application process. But if the job requires a Cory checker background, and let's be honest, there's some jobs that don't. So if you are a janitor, nine times out of ten, they don't require a Cory check. But if you're going to be working in the law department, you're going to be working in the finance office, they're going to run the Cory check. It allows those individuals individuals and again in the legal language it clearly states out that it's in that stage of the process for the application process it eliminates it and like I said in those two other communities it has been proven to be successful and I'm only going off of when I'm going to knock on doors when I'm going to try to talk to those individuals who are in these communities that are saying hey we need a job you want me off the street I need a job and so I think this just sets the tone as the city as an employer and encourages other to do so and I did remove the provision because Boston's way expansive and makes it everyone and I remember we talked about that and you said I wouldn't support that with a 10-foot pole counselor so I may try rolled back that provision to make sure it's just the city as an employer um, and it's contractors and not the city as a whole we cannot get into private America and I agree with you on that but this provision would just as a city and listen we already know we're in a $1.3 million deficit. We already know we're fighting to cut positions. So it's not like tomorrow the city of Holyoke is going to open its floodgates. And I agree with my colleague on the, the aisle program, and I know we disagree on that. But it's not like tomorrow we have this aisle program. But let's say in the future the city does get on the right path. We do begin to hire. I think we should send that message that if you have done your time, if you have come and you've rehabilitated yourself, you get that fair chance. And that's all. Counselor, I apologize. I cannot locate the original language that was submitted. I have it in the, the email from Attorney Carroll. I'll forward it to you, uh, you re-forward it to the committee so you can look at the... I, and again, this is just beginning the conversation. Right. So that way at a future date, I really would prefer you look at the legal language. So I, I know and I hope it will alleviate a lot of my colleagues' questions. And they're good questions to ask. Um, but I will forward that to the committee. <laughs> Um, so I appreciate you b sending that to us so we can look it over before the next discussion that we continue. And so if I could hear an, a motion to table to and, review. And under discussion. I don't um, believe the tabling is uh, debatable. Sure. Thanks. So, uh, I'll call a motion. So um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. No. Aye. So three to one. So um, if you can forward that, that would be great. Thank you. Pretty much appreciated. So all I was going to ask Nelson, since I wasn't allowed to speak, was that can you also ask Sheriff, Sheriff Kochi for um, recidiv recidivism rates? So alongside of the um, uh, rates of incarceration that we're experiencing and who's being incarcerated, can we also get the recidivism rates? Great. Uh, have we gotten that number two yet, or is that still lingering yeah, out there? Second. Oh, didn't we have something for these gentlemen? Yeah, the, the what number? What number is he? Sixteen. Councillor Sullivan's sign is one of them. Mike, is that? I need the honor roll, you mess. Did you? Yeah. Hang on. It's and Bresnahan. Congratulations. Item fourteen. Fort. Was this about the vacant building stuff? Yes. Yeah. I make a motion to take item fourteen out of order. Second. All in favor? Aye. Is it, it looks like he's here. Yeah, his papers are up. Maybe you want me to go uh, yeah. tell him. And then I have 20. We have people here for 21 also. <laughs> I think 15 is in this soup, 20. but I think we're waiting for a proposal, though. People are here for 21 also. Are they? Mm-hmm. Oh, no, 21 we already did. I mean 20. 20. Okay. So we'll go to that one next. Well, no, we're on fourteen. Sure maybe maybe there's nobody here. We got two we got two okay. two landlords here on the uh that we should you know. for fourteen? Yeah. Okay. So uh, all in favor of taking up item fourteen? Aye. 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 Filed by Council Bresnahan, order that the City Council consider amending section eighteen thirty five with respect to the vacant building fee charge in that we consider suspending the fee if owner has an open and valid building permit on said vacant property and work is actively taking place. Also, if a new owner purchases a vacant property, the vacant permit fee charge starts at year one for the new owner. Council Bresnahan? Yeah, just briefly, the, the I helped craft this years ago and, and, the, and the gist was basically to try to, to try to 
collect money to board up vacant buildings. Uh, but as time has gone on, uh, I, I have no problem relooking at this, revisiting it, uh, and just saying if you know, again, if I own a building and I'm being charged, you know, a thousand dollars a year because it's vacant, and Councillor Sullivan buys the building from me. You know why should he be punished if it's a legitimate sale and it's not you know uh, clandestine and, and, and Councillor Sullivan buys a building he should start at year one as a vacant building owner and not year one not three four or five to give him the chance to develop it um, you know another si similar situation is we have a, a building on the Elm and Dwight Street um, you know there was a fire there um, no control of the property owner valid permits have been taken out as we all know the insurance took a while to come through valid permits were being taken out. He had to relocate all the displaced families. The city of Hoyoke is, you know, charging about 1500 bucks a year. The, the intent of the law was not that we charge, you know, Hoyoke folks that own property in Hoyoke. There's three of them right here that live in Hoyoke. Two definitely. The one I'm talking about, Almond Dwight, lives in Hoyoke. Um, that was the intent. The intent was for kind of the out-of-town landlord. I'm not, I'm not, you know, I'm not pushing this vehemently, but I just think it's something to look at if we have some you know, landlords that want to purchase property, what's the incentive in buying a vacant building and renovating it if it's a four unit building and the vacant building charge because it's been vacant for over four years is $3,000. There's really no incentive for that. So I think if we have a new building owner wants to take over the property, it should start back at day one for the, you know, the hundred or the, whatever the cost is, is the, the vacant building fee. Um, and just in, encourage you know people to buy uh, buildings uh, in the city of Hoyoke and develop them and, and get them back on the tax rolls. It's a gist of it. Excuse me, Councilor Bartley. Yeah, I I, I I I'd like to speak in favor of this because <clears throat> um, th there's got to be a there's got to be a sense of you know fairness to the public, but but also an incentive for developers. So I, I don't know if we can if we can. I, I take it we would need to uh, amend the ordinance to to reflect this this change. I see that. Um, I I think ultimately the decision is in whose hand, Dan? Is in this, this in the building commissioner's hand or the board of health commissioner's hand? It's the uh, the board of health. Um, it's it, it's in tandem, but the board of health is the one that issues the the fine and the notice of, of vacancy. But obviously, if you're pulling a, the, the building department, would have to get involved. That there's a building permit that's actively on on scene um, I mean there may be there, there may be a little bit for them to be, perhaps talk about it a little bit as well and just say you know I, I mean I think you know if every 90 days the building commissioner went out there and, and, and you know saw that you know insulation was going up then the sheetrock was going up well it's an active building permit we don't want someone to use this to their advantage to just pull a building permit and sit on a property for another 16 months because he doesn't want to pay the fee so I mean, so, so I guess what we, we would need our, our so we don't have draft language at this point. Well, yes. What I would like this to is draft language? make sure the committee is aware of, this is an order that you took up when I was away. Yes. And This in 15, by the way, yes. which is about the appeal process. Yes. And we had Dr. Mazel here. You took up both the items, yep. and this language that was sent out to us and now we have it in hard copy was the result of that meeting. <laughs> And, um, and I can't remember we, if we had Sarah there or if we had Paul there at the time. I think Paul was here for the, that we're talking about yes, yes, abandoned yes, building yes. stuff. It, <laughs> yes, perfect timing. So um, we're on agenda item that is relating to, 14. it's number 14, and it's table, relating so. to the suspending of a fee if there's a permit and also um, if a new per person purchases it. Um, I would accept a suspension of rules to take up 15. 15 as well, because that's in the same order. All in favor? Aye. Aye. So we now have a package before us, 14 and 15. Item 15, filed by Councilor Jourdain, ordered that the, excuse me, Ordinance Committee review section 18-35, regulation of blighted and vacant buildings to consider revising the appeal process for vacant building registration and applicable fees. So now we have them both before us. We do have language that was developed after the meeting in April. And if you could run through the changes, I think it would help us immensely. Thank you. Welcome. 
good time. Absolutely. Well, <laughs> uh, and I apologize for getting it to you guys uh, just before uh, just for, before the meeting. So that's why I'm here to uh, uh, to give you the in-person review. Um, so the uh, the proposed language uh, responds to the comments uh, that were discussed at the April 11th meeting. Um, specifically, there's a uh, additional provision in there for a rehab plan exemption, which would allow for uh, deferral of uh, an outstanding registration fee um, <clears throat> during the period of uh, the rehabilitation. And then upon successful completion of that rehab plan, uh, that fee would be uh, waived. Um, <clears throat> there's also a uh, uh, section in here that's proposed, and could, uh, is it, if it would it be helpful, Paul, if you uh, for those of us that are into minutia, could you just kind of go page by page? Sure. Is that possible? Sure. Yeah. Thanks. <coughs> Starting with the, it looks like the fir there's a proposed change. To, is, I'm assuming this is the current ordinance, and you did a red line. Exactly. Okay, yep. so you have a change here to enforcement officer on page one, and it looks like you take out police and fire chief and put in building commissioner and board of health director. And Correct. Just left it. Okay. So that was some feedback uh, that I received uh, in speaking with the building commissioner uh, and the board of health. Um, historically, the board of health and the building department have been uh, the agencies that have actually enforced this ordinance. Um, that doesn't mean that there hasn't been conversations with police and fire, but the reality is is that they're just they're not okay. uh, doing that blight enforcement. So the thinking is to just sort of narrow what the expectation is. Okay. Um, Make it clear. Exactly. And under uh, owner, you have uh, shall mean it looks like here on page two shall mean an individual business entity, volunteer association, nonprofit. And it looks like you were looking for us maybe to consider one of these other entities. Correct. So that language hasn't changed, but there are some vacant properties owned by the Gas and Electric. Um, I don't believe the Housing Authority owns any vacant properties, uh, but that's something just, you know, if down the road, mm -hmm. how would we want to interpret that? Right now, uh, currently, the city does not uh, assess the vacant building registration fee on the Gas mm -hmm. and Electric. Well, that's something to think about. Mm -hmm. They had a vacant building? So why should they be exempt from a law anybody else has to follow? I'd say put them in. Yeah, okay. Well, kind of like that addition. Good catch, Paul. Mm. Um, okay, so moving, chugging right along here, we have vacant building definition change on two. So, so just on that, on, that, on that, Kim, so we'll make a motion to add HG and, e and HHA then. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And I And I make a motion to... Oh, well, actually, okay, so the, he already took it out. So, so, okay, very good. So we're down at vacant building. And uh, there's just a comment here uh, at the, so there actually, we'll start with, there is a, a, an addition here. Um, added to the definition of what constitutes a vacant building is uh, a structure lacking active water, heat, or electrical utility services. Um, looking at the records of DPW uh, is actually a really useful proxy for finding out what, what buildings are vacant. Uh, so that's just something that mirrors our current uh, sort of enforcement uh, activity. Um, but it, it really is a, a good proxy for uh, a vacant property. So keep it as an exemption rather from the second component of the um, fee requirement, as a, but keep it in for the purposes of uh, registration. Correct. And I, so I think uh, looking at that comment there um, about uh, th there was some conversation at the April 11th hearing uh, about how to handle a property that's being uh, rehabbed um, uh, but is vacant. Um, and I think there was, you know, maybe we could amend the definition of vacant building. Um, what I'm suggesting is to have a separate section later on um, in this ordinance uh, to deal with that for the sole reason that we would still want a rehab property be, to be considered vacant for, as, uh, as you mentioned, uh, the registration and the uh, maintenance requirements. Great. Okay. So looks like that's page two. Page three. Page three, I believe, um, just moves up a uh, provision in D sub one uh, D. So just sort of a housekeeping change. Yes, and uh, then in 
uh, D sub 2A, uh, just to clarify that the address that we've had many, many appeals where the basis for the appeal is I didn't receive this, I had no okay. notice of this. Well, you know, the assessed address was the vacant property. It got returned to the city. Um, so just to clarify in the ordinance that the notice we're providing is the notice you're providing the assessor. Right. What else yeah. can so, you do? Exactly. So if you give defective <laughs> notice, you give a defective <laughs> address, don't argue it as an excuse a defective notice. Absolutely. Yeah, I agree. I think we could just use that language and that mm -hmm. would do the trick. Yeah. Okay. So we're off to page four. You've got a lot going on here. I do. Um, one of the proposals here concerns the uh, the amount of the registration fees, which, of course, were, were recently increased. Um, somewhat, perhaps surprisingly, I have suggested reducing them back to the $3,000 uh, top fee. The reason for that is um, twofold. I think one is the effectiveness of, of practical enforcement, um, and the other is the potential legal challenge that could follow from um, imposing a $6,000 fee. Um, there was a Springfield ordinance that required a, a little bit different, it required a $10,000 bond to be posted. Um, and then from that bond, uh, the city was taking about $500 to $1,000 for an administrative fee. So the court actually struck down the bond on different grounds that it preempted foreclosure law or, and all sorts of interesting things. But uh, uh, the court did say the administrative fee was okay, but only to the extent that it reasonably anticipated the uh, city's uh, Cost. regulatory expenses. So if we sort of played the numbers out, $6,000 times, and we'd really have to look at not the number of properties we're actually collecting from, but the number of properties that would be applicable to, I think right now it would be a tough case to make uh, that we're actually spending that much on uh, enforcement of vacant buildings specifically. Um, I think if you run it at 3,000, it's a little bit safer of an argument. Um, I just suggest that. I know that's ultimately a policy decision that the council will make. Um, Is that on commercial or commercial and residential? Correct. Sorry. So the, this top rate we're talking about, uh, four plus unit residential and uh, commercial, industrial, uh, everything else. I think I could ar argue the case that we've had, you know, Essex House, 1.5 million. What's that? That's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of six thousand yeah. a year, you know. Um, I mean, we we've had, uh, you know, what's the cost of Maple and Jackson? You know, what's been the cost of? Even though uh, you you guys did a nice job to take that one down recently, the the one at um, Pine and uh, Jack Willahan Way, uh, right behind uh, the senior center there, right. that one right there. I mean, all of those things are like 180000 200000 I mean, we clip off these buildings. We end up getting left with these costs that, you know, when everybody runs away and it's like millions, you know, and I, I think what we're trying to do is like, is 3000 enough of a deterrent? Is 6000 a deterrent? I mean, argue you go higher, but I do agree. At, at some point, you can only go so much on an administrative fine. Yeah. And I think, so, you know, I agree. I wonder how a housing court would view that, but. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think the raw numbers support that. I mean, the amount of money we've spent on problems that have resulted from vacant properties, I think the challenge we would run into is the nuance that the lawyers would put on paper um, saying that this is just for your regulatory expenses, which is the sort of, you know, the salaries, the. Uh, you know, the cost of uh, my travel receipts to housing court. Uh, At the remediation I, Right. I, I think philosophically, you're, you're absolutely correct, Councillor Jordan, that these are huge costs. Um, and, you know, so again, I, I, I can provide a little bit more detail because, you know, even this blurb here, you haven't really had the time to weigh that. But I think it's just something that's worth putting out there. Uh, I know we yeah, you, you make a great point. And even on the regulatory, perhaps, um, 
you know, we've contemplated having additional resources put for this that probably that we don't because of cost restraints. I know, um, I know um, Mike has had proposals which I thought were good and um, Damien supported on, um, you know, demolition people mm -hmm. and things of this nature. And, uh, you know, may maybe that would support the case for, um, you know, these type of fees if we were getting them. Arguably, though, I'll bet you these people are just not paying these fees either anyways. So that goes, I think, to the other point that's challenging is that if even at 3,000, the sense that I get is that if we have in, in this ordinance, the changes we, we make, uh, no matter what they are, will provide more of a bright line rule of, of who this is applicable to. Mm -hmm. But I think what happens uh, with the Board of Health when they're having these hearings and they're weighing on one side imposing $3,000 and on the other side, uh, you know, the arguments that these folks are making that they're exempt. Um, when it's such a, you know, a black or white issue like that, you know, either you're paying three thousand dollars or you're paying nothing, um, it can it can start to influence the judgments that are being made. So, uh, I think there is an argument to be made in short in terms of what a reasonable figure is. Um, I know that the the adjustment was recently made about a year ago, um, and I think that. If, if it were put back to 3,000, I think the, the expectation should be in a year looking back at it saying, and can we now make the case it. for, um, but again, I think it's a policy judgment, strictly a policy judgment that, you know. You, but would it be fair to say that because there's a lot more attention being paid to this and we have a better system set up, that that is probably resulting in more positive changes than the amount of the money? Absolutely, yeah. I, I think I think that's a fair uh, assessment. I don't, I don't think anybody doubts that you know three thousand dollars a year is is uh, is a hefty uh, is a hefty penalty. Um, I think what we've we've gotten hit on is the belief that they're not actually going to have to pay it. Right. That's where that's where it's been weak. Right. Um, I mean, we could put it at a million dollars, and if we're collecting zero, it's, it's still yeah. right. It sounds good, Councilor Lisi. Uh, yeah, I was just going to make that point that it, if it's out of reach, then it, people aren't going to follow the law anyhow because they're just going to say they, they'd rather do things on the, the black market, so to speak, right under the table, um, than than comply with the laws that we're providing if it just seems so um, excessive or you know out of reach of what can can really be done. Michael wants to speak. Oh, Councilor Sullivan. Yeah, I'd like to um, make a suggestion to the committee as we consider this um, is a, a two-tier approach to the fine. You could have one on the residential side or the small uh, apartments and stuff like that. You really need to put some serious teeth on the commercial side with a clear differentiation between people that are actively working on a property and not penalizing them a dime if they're actively working on it and investing money in this city and not adding to their burden. Right. Where, the right. And, and where, whereas, all right, whereas we have other land property owners, large commercial property owners, and I'll, I'll use an example on Front Street called Holyoke Die Cut Card that has sat there now vacant and blighted for 10 years. And uh, we all know what we're talking about here. And in something like that, we should force, we should be using an ordinance like this to force their hand to either develop that property, do something with it, or get out. Yeah. Yeah. And just couldn't, for clarity, for the residential properties, the uh, fee is $500 if it's one to three units. And the large amounts we're talking about are for the Four multi. More housing of four or more and the commercial properties well, and like i said you know you, you get into four you, you know four families not that large of a commercial investment right. but when you've got a four-story building right. in the heart of downtown <coughs> i think we should have a much stiffer fine well um maybe we could make an amendment and keep you the mean higher after you go over so many units higher it's even higher yeah building yeah square footage or base it on something like that would that be reasonable to his point yeah i mean i think that just to to sort of reiterate the, the current structure is for residential properties is currently 250 um 
uh, for for one, two, three unit properties, uh, and then for anything else, commercial, which is essentially commercial and apartment blocks, you have this uh, this this tiered structure up to six thousand. Um, so it, that distinction is made um, between you know your residential properties, where really the value of getting those is is on the list, so we can put them in receivership and take them to housing court. We're not really worried too much about collecting a lot of money for that. The value is getting those registrations in because that's giving us the roadmap and information we need. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas to Councillor Sullivan's point, with the large buildings, you want to put. The, the threat of that that uh, fee to incentivize what we'll get to a little bit uh, uh, later on here in the revisions, which is you know really a clear incentive to say you're either going to pay this or you're going to develop it, and if you're going to develop it, you're going to pull permits, get architectural really drawings for a large it. building. Put teeth to that to right. really but hold them to, yeah. to the rehab. The draft does say 500 for the residential, though, that I'm looking at. Correct, Councillor. So it, it currently is 250, and oh. I, I did add in a suggestion there to consider at 500. Okay. Uh, the reason being there is that we do have very high rates of compliance with um, uh, vacant building for, for, for the one- and two-families because 80% of the time, maybe more they're coming from banks so they're just writing the check Beautiful. um regardless okay. you know and and uh there, you know there's actually there's a couple folks i mean i'll just be honest i mean I, some of this does come down to just you know being reasonable if you know if we were on the cape we would have to be worrying about vacation homes and all that you know we have uh we have one gentleman who you know checks on his property once a month uh you know it's he doesn't live there full time, but he gets sent this letter, and we say, "Well, you know, I mean, it, reasonably speaking, here, I'm not, you know, we're not looking to hold you to 500, uh, you know, 500 a year for it." I'm assuming we have a definition of vacant, right? So that that's what, the, what, what, front. What, what, maybe we should just revisit that for a minute. Because where it said no water, no electric, no. Oh yeah, I mean, so. You know, it's not like the snowbird who goes down to Florida, and then they <laughs> right. leave their house for six months. I mean, you don't shut the water off at your right, house right. or you stop, you know, so turn your power point. off. Right. That, that language, I think, protects house. that individual oh, that, that, you know, yeah. is, is sort of a borderline. And, you know, that, that's the sort of thing where it's not going um, uh, it's, it's to come up with a, a you know, large industrial building. They're, yeah. they're, they're cutting their utilities off. I mean, exactly. They, yeah, yeah. they don't have utilities to okay. have on. So with our exactly. back and forth on the 6,000, where are we kind of – landing with that you're recommending that we go back down to the 3,000 well, the, the other the other cases side are certain cases the, the other side of that is that I, I, I'm also suggesting here a big piece of feedback I got from the Board of Health is that it's ultimately unwieldy to have these four tiers and every year update where a property is and I mean to begin with it's difficult to determine what that year of vacancy is what ends up happening because you have to err on the side of caution with this, is that um, for the difference between, I can't think of many instances unless they're, they're just very specific ones where we know, you know, one, two, three years that we've been tracking it, that we're able to follow that. For the most part, if we get a property in that isn't on that list, and, and a lot of vacant properties that you would know are vacant in Holyoke, may not have been added to that list. I've seen that, you know, th those trickle in. Determining that your vacancy can get tricky, so a lot of times it's either three or more or, you know, One. <laughs> what, whatever, yeah, whatever can be proved. So um, the Board of Health had suggested uh, moving this down to, to two, like a yes or no binary. Um, mm -hmm. Is this a long-term vacant property? Is this a short-term vacant mm -hmm. property? So two uh, years and less or two years and more? I think that would be a, a reasonable Simplicity. point. Yeah. So I mentioned that because I think it goes to the question of how we want to handle the, the fee amount. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think what's proposed here is uh, $1,500 for two years or less, uh, and then jumping up to whether it's three, four, five, six for two years or more. And then the caveat to that, again, we're sort of, you know, we haven't gotten to the, uh, the other parts of this uh, ordinance here where we're addressing what's happening to the developer who's pulling permits and uh, having a rehab plan. Because the people that, yeah, I think what we're looking to do is soften the rules on those that are right. really doing, doing a good faith effort. Right. But this would be the hammer for those that are not. Exactly. So, I mean, maybe we lower from six to five, uh, maybe, uh, 
but maybe three, I mean, two or more years. I mean, that's a yeah. long time to know. I could see the, what's the 1500 right now? So 1500, it, it, it would create a new level. So right now it goes 500, 1000, 3000. Right. Um, so 1500 seems so reasonable. So 1500 might years. sound harsh to the new buyer, but what I would suggest, and I don't want to go out of order here, but there's these two sections that are referred to earlier for the deferral for a deferral full rehab and then plan. The wave. Yeah. And also what would I think be administratively easy and a big impact would be for the, the folks who do not have a full rehab plan but are coming to the city and saying, Well I have permits, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. You maybe have a permit to fix some of the shingles, but the roof in the back is still collapsed. What we could say is that they would be able to, uh, and I spoke with the building commissioner about this, they would be able to offset their registration fee by the amount of permit fees they paid. So now you're encouraged to. Right. That's There's good. an incentive. Right. Yeah. So that 1500 I think at first sounds a little bit harsh for a new yeah. break in property, but it actually, you know, you either can get the whole amount waived by doing a legitimate rehab or um, get a portion of it waived by doing something. Right, and I think that was the gist of these two orders is... I, I agree, yeah. Maybe we, maybe we don't go as generous as three, but we go maybe with five for... Because there's going to be a lot of exemptions to it. I don't know. What, is, what are other... For companies? over two For the years. over two group. Mm -hmm. But it's 3000 every year. Yes. The, the well, thing that I'm concerned about, though, is, you know, is 3000 they're going to say, well, I'd have to do a million-dollar rehab. Or $3,000 th worth of permits. You know, um... Well, at least, that, but then you'd have to do work because if you pull the permits, at some point the building commissioner is going to say there's no substantive progress on those. Right, and there's language in here that says it has to actually be happening. Right. Yeah. Right. So my my thinking is, it you've got the group that are doing stuff, the people that are these you know six, five, six, seven, eight years, um, on a commercial property, they probably just say. I'll pay the three grand, or or they won't pay anything, uh, anyway. So you know, at, at least if that's the case, then let's just get to it. Then you know, if we can, if the bill's high enough between the taxes they might not be paying and the registration fees that they're not be paying, I would assume you guys are going to be proactive to take these on tax title or whatever. And that, that that's I think that's a, I, sorry I don't mean to interrupt. I yeah, because it's, it's when they go into the state of the Essex House vacant ten years, then it's like my God, we don't want it. But if these buildings actually were in decent condition at one time, people were living in them and operating them, you know, um, you know, had it been taken early, we probably could have flipped them. I think, and I, so I think that's a good point because something Councillor Sullivan mentioned at the, uh, the April hearing was that uh, you, you also run a little bit of, there's kind of like a, 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 a I don't know what the phrase is, but uh you're doing a bit of a dance here because um, by putting these on the taxes, you are increasing the likelihood that a property will go into tax title. Um, it could have an adverse effect of, you know, just burdening a property with, with, with taxes to remove it from the productive market. Exactly. So I, you know, I think, you know, now there's some interplay with some other issues that are going on in the city in terms of, you know, the ability for, um, you know, uh, uh, if you have a property that's in tax title uh, right now, if an owner wants to, to purchase it, you get an a, a approach from a private uh, owner uh, and they're asking for a waiver on some of the interest to make it marketable. We're not able to do that. Um, and that's, that's something that does come up from time to time. And of course, the city can foreclose on it. We're having an auction tomorrow, um, but that requires time and resources for the city to follow through on those rehab plans. And you know, just generally speaking, the private market is going to be able to respond to these things throughout the year, where you know we get one crack at it. So, if I'm hearing you correctly, it sounds like you're recommending the three thousand dollar rate, and you're saying that you have other tools to go after the big long-term offenders. Would that be That's a good fair point. to so, say? I mean, there, there's a $300 per day provision in here for fines. So, I mean, there's, there's no shortage on uh, I mean, taking do we those do actions. It? Do we? 
We, we, uh, I, I wouldn't say that every building gets issued a fine, but that's something in the last couple of years we've, we've used more and, okay. and we can add those to the taxes as well. So, so that's been a component. All right. Thank you. All right. So let's revisit that. Okay. Um, excuse me. Oh, Councilor what? Sullivan? I, I'd ask if the uh, committee would consider a few comments from the public. We have two developers here that might, uh, wish to uh, enlighten you or weigh in on their experience? I would be happy to hear a couple of comments, but what I'd like to do is get through this document first. Yep. So we can We're do almost a, there. a lightning round. That, that, was, that was a heavy one, but uh, some, of the, some of the sort of uh, simple stuff here. Uh, the next section just uh, puts in some log. language uh, clarifying the, uh, the lien uh, ordinance that the city uh, passed, the council passed uh, last year uh, so that any unpaid uh, registration fees are added to the tax bill. Oh, okay. Um, this section here about registration fees shall be expended for the purpose of regulatory costs. That's something that is established through the revolving fund, but also was something that was picked up in the Springfield uh, SJC case. Basically said that, that this money has to be used for that purpose. Mm -hmm. um, moving down a little bit here, we have some language that mirrors uh, requires a, a written log. So there, there's a current requirement that the owner of a vacant property must inspect and maintain the property on a monthly basis. This adds in a common requirement that bank preservation companies have that they maintain a written log at the property um, that demonstrates some proof that the property is being inspected on a monthly basis and also um, uh, encourages the owner to, to do those uh, inspections. Um, again, the next thing is a, a, 20, a, a posting of uh, owner contact information. Uh, this language just mirrors what's in the sanitary code for durable material posting and the size of the posting. Um, then the last section here for maintenance requirements uh, just reiterates uh, existing requirements to mm -hmm. um, maintain the property free of uh, trash and debris. Uh, but again, these maintenance requirements are important to spell out because they would be a condition of uh, this rehab plan mm -hmm. exemption mm -hmm. compliance with them. Uh, so uh, the appeal section is sort of the next uh, big topic that was uh, discussed. Mm -hmm. um, the language does establish, it takes it out of the Board of Health. Um, I think this is something that's, you know, maybe worth some further discussion, but uh, the, this concept would essentially say that the director of the Board of Health, the building commissioner, and uh, the law department each have a designee to be the appeal panel. Um, and then all together? Correct. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that was, that, our cons our, that was our consensus from the last meeting. That mm -hmm. sounds good, actually, yeah. because then all the different issues get considered. And the Board of Health would appreciate that as well. Mm -hmm. And then some some of the language in here too is is uh, f you know for the appeal the focus should really be on what's in the ordinance now which is this is is it a vacant building and what the duration of vacancy is uh, so the language clarifies that you know look th th there should be some documentation about um, you know what uh, what was going on at the property at the time uh, that the fee was imposed um, and that failure to uh, fill out the appeal form that the Board of Health uh, puts together uh, should be a, a, a basis to deny the appeal. That appeal form says, you know, look, are you appealing that this is not a lawfully licensed business or a lawful residence, um, you know, and, and to state the date that it became that. Um, and, uh, you know, we get a lot of blank forms because people, you know, don't want to commit to anything there. Um, <laughs> So would it be fair to say if we adopt the first part with the waivers and the deferral that there would be fewer appeals or not? I, I you know, I imagine just practically there will, the appeal process will be an information session for these provisions. I, I think that's how it will play out. I think next year we could expect to get a lot of activity. I think that's just you know, the reality. I think long term, Correct. You should really start to see very few appeals because you're either vacant or you're not. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. All right. 
Um, you have a bunch of different rewrites inside appeal. So what's offset? Why don't you go to that section five on uh, page five? So the idea here, um, and maybe it uh, uh, might make might have made sense to switch this, switch the order of these with the deferral one. But the idea here is that we're not going to waive the fee unless you have a legitimate rehab plan. Um, and this this gets difficult because you have you know we have some owners of of large buildings coming in and they're getting you know uh, architectural plans and design plans and they're doing good work. But they're not really, you know, they have, <laughs> right, they have like a six-year plan. But they're, so there's this middle ground where, you know, there, there's this policy desire to provide some relief from this registration fee. But at the same time, you know, we want you to be doing more. So you still want to have that incentive going. Um, on the other hand, with, with this offset provision, we also want it to be administratively enforceable. So um, essentially what it's saying is that um, the owner assessed a registration fee can request an offset in um, an amount equal of the, uh, the greater of. So you can't get both of them, but you can get whichever one is more beneficial to you. And that is either uh, the amount of permit fees that you've paid during the year um, or 50% of the registration fee um, if you demonstrate that you've complied with all of the maintenance requirements, uh, including the polycarbonate board up. So that's, that's a really important, um, I think, ordinance change that was made last year, and we're actually starting to see some buildings uh, uh, comply with this uh, clear polycarbonate board up. So I think it's something that's definitely worth incentivizing. And those maintenance requirements also include, you know, keeping the property clean and the roof buttoned up, right? Exactly. So it having, deteriorate. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's, um, you know, I think what's difficult about that second one is uh, there's going to be a lot of arguments between owners. Well, it, you know, it, it's been fine all year, and you know, absent a city inspection during that time, it's you know, it might be tough to uh, uh, make those determinations. So it probably opens up to a little bit of you know, right, um, and that that request for the offset would have to be received by the uh, the date of the appeal. So that's not a retroactive thing where someone's trying to get out of an appeal. Um, and in writing with documentation. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Um, so this next section about the uh, the rehabilitation plan. So this just reiterates the uh, the intent uh, to exempt a, a a property from the registration fee if they're rehabbing the property. Um, what I think would make sense is for it to be deferred uh, and then waived upon completion completion of the rehab plan. Um, so this first section allows for a one-year deferral, so you would have to renew each year. Um, the, uh, any outstanding registration fees should be paid before, similar to like a tax sale repayment plan. If you have outstanding registration fees and then you enter a rehab plan, you should have those amounts paid um, before receiving deferral of any future ones. Um, then there's a section just basically stating what a rehab plan is. It incorporates what the um, existing ordinance provision for uh, rehab plans for corrective orders uh, under, um, I think it's subsection C. Um, and then also includes some specific language here uh, that you'll see with our tax title properties and, and uh, housing court properties just requiring uh, you know, a narrative of the property condition uh, a list of what repairs need to be made, dates for completion, and uh, estimated dates for completion and commencement of that work, um, dates for pulling permits, so on and so forth. And is uh, that pretty standard stuff? Yeah, yeah, and, and that's I think that's also giving the building commissioner a uh, sort of framework of what you know he or she is looking at to measure against, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then a written determination. Uh, Right now, for code, code enforcement uh, rehab plans, we have an agreement form that basically would lay out, you know, here's what you've agreed to. Uh, if you fail to do any of these things, here's what's going to happen. This is when the inspection is going to happen, all that. So that 
I think would make sense for this as well to lay out what the effect of this rehab plan would be on your registration fee and um, any inspections that should be scheduled. Uh, one of one of the things that uh, seemed to make sense was uh, uh, this idea of having the owner submit uh, a quarterly report, um, essentially sort of mirroring what the the monthly inspection requirement and the maintenance requirements is. Uh, but you know, if you're performing rehab, you know, once every three four months to provide, you know. Uh, sort of position of what's what's happening there um, because I, I think it would be difficult to expect to have routine inspections on all of these right so th this sort of gives a bit of a, um, a, a bit of a burden on the owner to demonstrate that that things are moving along <coughs> yeah you might go look if you don't get anything for six exactly months, right, right. <laughs> Um, and then the last, last couple of points here on the rehab plan, uh, just reiterating that uh, during the deferral period, the registration fees, uh, they remain a municipal charge uh, because, again, they will be imposed if they are not, um, if the rehab plan is not complied with, but uh, the municipal charge uh, wouldn't accrue any interest or late fees. Um, or preclude issuance of a permit. Normally, if you have outstanding municipal charges, you can be denied a license permit, things of that sort. So obviously, we wouldn't want to deny folks permits for uh, doing this plan. Um, and uh, uh, again, uh, it, the waiver portion of this is that the plan is completed, then the fees are waived. Mm -hmm. Well, this looks very complete to me. I missed the earlier discussion, but I think it's pretty thorough, very thorough. Um, yes, I just wanted to see if there was anybody I hadn't I noticed. <laughs> but um, very thorough. If, if you want to well, make really well done. that motion. Sure, I'll, I'll make a motion to allow uh, the public to briefly Second. address this. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Could I just ask Paul a quick the technical question? Oh, sure. Council President Han. Paul, where, any monies that we're collecting, where is that money going? Right now, they are deposited as general fund revenues. There is a, a, a the vacant building revolving fund has been established. Um, we are in the process of doing this this Munis general billing component, and through that, we're going to get uh, the fund codes that we need to set up that revolving fund. I'm hoping that's going to be completed by by the summer. Yeah, because I, I think that's a great idea. Because like if we if we get some money and we don't have <laughs> compliance, then we can pay someone to board up a building, Absolutely. cut the grass, all this other. And also, I mean, is it in your opinion? I mean, is it, it having that appeal process? Is that really? I mean, you're, you're talking about a doctor and two nurses, or whatever the makeup of the board is. You know, they understand sources of filth and vagrancy and the problems with vacant buildings. You know, the impact. You know the social, the economic impact, the health impacts about the community that lives in that area. But I mean, is it better for us to say like, you know, we're going to charge you X amount of dollars for a vacant property, and if you disagree with it, then you know we'll see you in housing court, and we'll let a judge mm -hmm. make that decision, and we take it right out of the board's lap. Well, that's the panel that you spoke of, right? Right. I, I think Council President, you know, makes point of you know just say no appeal process. Right, what's the right charge? Venue? Um, I mean, my feeling on, on something like this is that, you know, if we come back a year later and tweak this, it doesn't mean that this was wrong. I think it's something that evolves a bit. Sure. I think the public notice of, of what this is and how it applies, um, I think the appeal process is, I think I, I referred to it as the information session because it does end up serving that role. Um, one of the alternatives that was suggested would be to have a, a disinterested uh, a, a hearing officer appointed under uh, what is a, a 40U. Uh, so it's what we use for our, our, our fire tickets. tickets. Yeah. I think that's a great idea. I think it's something definitely on the table. Um, I think it would be tough now to hand all this over to someone and say, uh, go interpret this. Um, I like that idea. I, I think that's where we might want to get to. Um, but um, uh, yeah, I mean, I. I, I, I got you. Great. Thank yeah. you, Paul. I appreciate it. Good work, man. To follow up on Council Bresahan's question, so if there was the panel of three, could it be allowable under the ordinance that if two of three were there, they could act? Or does this mean there have to be all three there to do anything? I think I put a provision in here, and if I didn't, then I need to add it. Um, 
but there was an idea of even one of three, uh, so, so four E states that the panel shall establish written appeal procedures in forms not inconsistent with this section mm -hmm. um, because I think it, things like that about how, how it would play out if if there could be written I mean I think with parking tickets you Wait, can have having uh, three people sitting there for three right hours. And that's, I think that's a concern about this model is the amount of time and resources it's going to consume for three city officials. Um, I think one of the ways to deal with that is, is like with the parking tickets, you can have a written or a in-person hearing. Okay. So I think there's some things to play around with there. Yeah. yeah. Okay, good. All right, so did we vote on the suspension of rules? Yes. Well, I just want okay. to, just, just, I just want, just, oh, Council Bartlett. Just on that vacant building revolving fund, is that exists so so we, we pass that to ordinance mm -hmm. uh 10 to 5 by the way good memory <laughs> oh no i know who voted against it i i can rattle them off right now if you want but I, i'm not going to do that uh, i know where i voted um but is so that fund is it is it actually funded is it so so, so these so these fines are ever going to go to that that fund Correct. So the, the so, fund the fund has been passed, but it, it hasn't yet been actually established. So these funds are still uh, going into general revenue. Um, the 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 implementation well, part the implementation part of it is to get uh, the right revenue code so that we have all of our tickets, board up costs, registration fees going into that. So it's it's just it's a matter of it's just a matter of implementation. So that's just you connecting with the city auditor. In, in a simplest form, yeah. So you're working on that? Uh, oh, absolutely. So I mean, part part of it, it beyond just connecting with the auditor, it's it's training all the clerks and the board of health and the building department um, on what on, on what this would play out uh, for. Uh, one of the challenges too is that when these liens, when when everything gets leaned, it's going over to the tax collector. Um, if it's hitting tax sales, it's going to the treasurer. So when payments come in on taxes and on uh, to the treasurer, having that money get rerouted back into the revolving fund is a little bit tricky. So that's probably the most difficult part of this, and that's why we need those munis codes so that the the three thousand dollar payment uh, gets entered in the board of health as a, a as a demand for payment, and it will follow itself all the way through the tax collector uh, to the treasurer um, with, with the tax hell redemption. So that's that's kind of the tricky part of it, but um, as, as I mentioned, I'm hoping that that's implemented by by the summer. Okay. okay, under suspension of rules, if folks would like to briefly speak to the ordinance, if you would come and give your name and address and let us know. Thank you. Glenn Sheely for 48 Holy Cross Road. Um, in 2010, I bought eight industrial mill properties on Water Street. I applied to the Historic Commission for permission to demolish all eight of the buildings, which was granted. Applied to the Building Commissioner for permission to demolish, and I was told I could not get pull permits for all the buildings at one time. So I'm afraid I, I now have a bill from the city for $9,000 for having one vacant building on my premises. 17 and a half acres. I've been working actively six days a week for seven years now, taking these buildings down. The intent has always been to take them down to the ground, which I'm doing. One building in particular, number 16 Water Street, which is the one assessed, is and has been occupied by HGE for either two or three generating properties in the building. I wrote the not, building inspector. Not, not to be rude, but we're trying to figure out how the ordinance would speak to this. I mean, I, I appreciate the, your individual okay. I'll, circumstance. I'll, but I'll be you, very clear. The ordinance just, doesn't speak to it. My position so doesn't speak to it. Because I, so, I got a bill. First year, I wrote a letter to the health department telling them that it was not a vacant building. Never received a reply. <laughs> Second year, I got a bill. I copied the same letter with a different date, sent it back in. Third year, I got a bill demanding $9,000. Okay? So that, would this come under the appeals portion of what we're talking about? Well, it about? doesn't work under your appeals process because I can only appeal one year. I've never received a correspondence ever from the 
Health Department. So, Paul, you want to address that? So, right. So, just to see how it would fit from an ordinance point of view with what we're looking at. Correct. So that it, it, right now it would need to be appealed. Um, what I think uh, this situation reflects is that without a, a process for a rehab plan or an exemption or anything like this, things get murky. Uh, and, and then the appeal process becomes the point in time where uh, somebody would have the opportunity to contest to this in any the manner. Exactly. So in your opinion, if we were to adopt this ordinance, would a person in a circumstance such as that where they wanted to do 12 things but they could only do one at a time um, at the request of the city or at the rule of the city under this that we're considering would a circumstance like that be able to be resolved under it's, it sounds like a circumstance like this and, and I mean this is ultimately all public record so I'm, I'm happy to share uh, the okay. sort of results of this of this situation um, uh, you know this would fall under I guess a demolition plan uh, the building had remained vacant so we continue to send the letters out um, and the property was going to get liened. Uh, we did receive a correspondence from Mr. Sheely, um, and specifically the uh, this information about the HG&E uh, turbines on the property and how that was preventing things with the demolition permit. That was, I mean, that was ultimately satisfactory from the city's perspective. Um, I think under the ordinance, what we would want to see is you know a written plan saying. You know, here's our demolition plan. We're applying for this permit. Here's why we're not able to. We're trying to work things out with the HGE. &E. And you know, from that, you know, there might be some complexities here that we're not looking to solve with this process. Um, Separate uh, from it, right? So I, I, you know, perhaps I owe Mr. Shealy a, a phone call back to, to <laughs> clarify uh, these things. But I mean, that the city's position is that, you know, for, and, you know, again, it's all public record. So, uh, but the, you know, with this, because of that HGE &E issue. Um, I'm not waiting into the middle of that one. Uh, so if, if that's what's holding up the demolition permit, you know, it, it's been treated uh, at least up until this point in time uh, as a, a valid plan for demolition, which okay. uh, we would want to see formalized through this ordinance. Okay, but just as an example, if we adopt this ordinance, that type of a situation could be adequately addressed and answered. Exactly. So it would be a, a written plan that's, for that's what I'm after here with over them. over the three year period. Go, going forward or three years. I'm not paying the nine thousand dollars. I can assure you that. Correct. So okay. I, I, you know, I think but, that we're in agreement that there, you know, there's a there was a valid plan for. But I want. But your appeal period okay, under folks, the statute excuse me, does. Excuse me. Okay. We are under suspension of rules letting folks make comments relative to the ordinance, okay. not do an appeal hearing. Thanks anyway. No, I understand. Really, <laughs> we're trying to be patient and generous with hearing feedback, and I think we kind of got the picture on this one. Okay. So if there's anybody else who would like to give us comments relative okay, to the ordinance, you. please keep it brief. We need to stay focused. We still have a long agenda. My name is Greg Virgilio. I live at 733 High Street. I'm a property owner in Holyoke. I own and manage a number of uh, residential properties. Uh, I uh, wrote a letter. It'll probably take me about five minutes to go through it. Uh, I've been waiting patiently. Uh, right, but can you relate your points yes, to I the will. ordinance? Absolutely. Thank you. So, uh, first of all, I want to state that I'm in favor of the vacant building uh, registration fee. Uh, I think it makes a lot of sense. Uh, Which one? All of them. Uh, for the, you know, three, one to three, uh, four, up, uh, four and up, the commercial and the industrial property. Um, I think it's important that it be administered correctly, consistently, uh, and, and applied consistently. I think in order to do that, you need to establish a full-time or at least establish a position, a uh, paid position, somebody to do that. And I think you can use the funds, the administrative uh, portion of the funds, to do that. Um, I think it's most important because from what I've seen of it, it hasn't been administered consistently, and that's one, been one of the big problems. Um, so you need to establish a paid position, somebody that's going to do that. Um, the panel's paid, right? 
I don't think a panel could administer all the minutia that's going to be involved in administering all of the vacant 240 some odd vacant properties that we have in the city. I think it's going to take more than that to administer it properly. I think there are five groups of people, or five groups that are going to, the categories that these vacant buildings are going to fall into. First, there's going to be the rehab, the people that are going to rehab their property. I am one of those. I currently own 185 Pine Street. I've pulled permits. I have a rehab plan in place. I am not paying any, I have not been charged any vacant building fee. And I think that that's a good thing. People that are rehabbing and doing positive things in the city shouldn't be penalized for doing that. And I think that the way it's written, I think the ordinance covers that. The second group are the people that will choose to sell their property instead of holding it vacant. Now, I think it's important that when a property is sold, there be a window, a period of time, so that the new buyer, the new owner of the property, isn't immediately hit with a registration fee. And I think the ordinance does cover that as well. I think, ideally, the seller should be required to disclose that the building is currently on a vacant property watch list. And I think that if you had a sign to be placed on these buildings, it would alert any potential buyer to the fact that this property is on a vacant watch list. It might also provide notice to the neighbors and other people in the neighborhood. The third group would be those who choose to pay the fee and keep the property vacant. I suggest that this is probably less desirable than either one or two and should carry a higher cost. And I think it does with the increased fee over a number of years. I think that's a good thing. I would like to suggest that I think it's legal, and I think from what I saw in the ordinance and in law, that you could allot a portion of this fee into an escrow account to be used specifically to rehab the property. So that it could be possible to charge a $6,000 fee, setting aside a certain amount of it, perhaps half of that, to go into an escrow account to be used specifically to either demolish or restore the building at some point when it comes out of vacancy. I think that's legal, and I think it's possible. It might be an administrative problem, but I think that problem could be handled. So you're advocating to keep the $6,000? I'm advocating for a higher fee, perhaps even higher. In a case of a commercial property or industrial property, it could be $12,000. It could be $50,000. But that would go into an escrow account to be used to demolish the building at some point in the future or rehab it. I think it's a fair point to be considered. And then another group, I think I've covered that. The last group would be to demolish the property. And I think in general for smaller properties, this is not the most desirable option. And I think you want to avoid that. I think having money set aside to rehab the property would be an incentive for a buyer to purchase that property and put it back on the tax rolls. I think that's going to be primarily market-driven. And go ahead. I'll let you finish because I think I should wait for the chair to recognize me. So, sorry. Okay. And then the last category is owners who do nothing. Okay. Now, that means that they don't pay the fee and don't do anything in the way of recognizing the registration fee. I think that the city needs to be aggressive in putting those either into tax title or into receivership. I think a portion of this administrative fund should be used to develop the receivership program in the city, which I think is severely, severely underfunded and underutilized. 
The city of Springfield uh, puts property into receivership at the drop of a hat. Holyoke does nothing, absolutely nothing, in terms well, of in terms of receivership. In fairness, we are doing more than we were doing that three years be, that ago. That may be true, <laughs> but you're still a far cry from where you need to well, be. In terms, and because receivership is an important tool in handling vacant properties, uh, and it, it's it's a uh, a very a very useful tool uh, for handling vacant properties. I think that it needs to be developed in this city. And it is being used more. Um, uh, yes, and it should be. Councilor Lisi. Thanks. Um, thanks for coming down, Greg. Mm -hmm. The question I had for for the idea that you had about the escrow account. Do you mean that the escrow account is dedicated to the building, so that if somebody else wanted to come along and fix it up? If it fell into tax title, they could utilize that escrow account. That would be my idea because it should be. Uh, my thinking is it should be dedicated to the property. Yes. That sounds like a lot for the city to uh, it does administer. Like, I mean, you know, it's doable. I think you know we do it with security deposit escrow accounts all the time. It's yep. done for every tenant. Why can't the city do it for a building? I mean, it seems feasible. Um, and then it, it does. I think what seems more. Uh, more feasible in terms of a lower hanging fruit that we could actually implement is um, using the the fines and fees that go into the revolving fund to in part fund um, the receivership program. I think that I think that makes sense. As that well. sounds yeah. something yeah. that we could actually handle at this point in time. I think bottom line is I'm I'm I don't think we're I'm opposed to a higher fee because I think it covers the costs that are associated with these vacant buildings, as Councillor Jordan pointed out, you know, you, you, you demolish uh, the Essex house, and what does that cost? Close mm -hmm. to, I don't know, a million dollars, I don't know. And then, and then the lawsuits involved with it. It's, it's a tremendous burden on the city. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is oh, there anyone oh, actually, else? Yeah. Can I ask for one question? Sure. There has been um, some comment made um, previously regarding if you purchase a building and say the prior owner was five years in and they were paying 3000 a year, 6000 a year, whatever, and now you buy it, they want to restart the clock so you're down to the $1,500 fine again. Um, wouldn't you agree, though, that I'd be warm to doing that for the new owner, provided there's like they have to submit the rehab, a rehab plan, say, within a year. Otherwise, what's the point of giving them some break, right? Would you agree with that? I think I would. If I were a buyer of one of those buildings, I think if I were to buy that building, I would buy it. Can you speak it, into the microphone? Uh, I think I would buy it with the intent of rehabbing it. Right. Okay, so and I'm not going to go and buy a vacant building just to hold it vacant. Right, I mean, because if you're so just as bad as the last sense. guy, now, if I do what, have a rehab, incentive? Now, if I do have a rehab plan, and it's on the table, I'm going to be, uh, you know... There's not going to be any fine. He's going to get deferred uh, under uh, this. Uh, yeah. yeah, and so uh, the question is, does that a prior accumulated amount, um, does that, that's been paid, I assume, or else the property would have been into tax title or receivership, right? I would say that has to be paid at closing. I would, I would suggest no different than accrued taxes. Right. okay. At the transfer okay. of the right. property. So that yeah. if, it, if we leaned it, right. If we leaned okay. it. Well, let's hope that we did <laughs> to protect our position. Did. Okay. Great. Okay, thank you. Just want to do that quick follow-up. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So, question for Paul? I'm oh, sorry. Can we, let, um, can we okay. just... Arrow Properties, who wants to speak yeah. first? Sorry, may I speak? Yes, <laughs> please. Stephen Bosco, home address 431 Appleton Street, apartment 3R. Um, just a few different points that hopefully are related. Sometimes when I hear people speak about this issue, um, I hear things like, oh, it shouldn't be too hard to uh, apply for a permit, get a rehab plan together, get an architect in there, get their, get drawings together, get the financing together get together the right subcontractors and workers to, to do the renovation. Sounds like a lot to me. <laughs> and, um, you know, follow all the myriad of uh, regulations that exist about exactly how those renovations have to take place. The, I would just add a cautionary note that everybody else's job, someone else's job always looks very easy until you have to do it. And so um, these things should happen quickly in a perfect world. They, they don't always happen quickly in this world. Um, point number two, 
I think the I think the committee is thinking about this in the right way and kind of moving in the right direction and and hitting the right issues here. Um, but I think the the principal virtue of this vacant building registration um, regime is that it takes owners who are kind of sitting on properties and trying to speculate and hoping that somebody's going to come ten years from now or five years from now and pay some really high price. And, you know, the property is going to go up in value like it has in other places. And taking that person and saying, you, you can't really do that. You either have to renovate the property or you have to sell it to somebody who will. You know, there may be somebody right down the street who's got the money and the subcontractor's lighting up and ready to go, and they want to work on that property, but they can't because some speculator is holding it, holding out for a higher price. And if the market turns in the other direction, the speculator is just going to walk away. So that's the virtue, that the, this, this vacant building registration fee kind of pushes the property in the right direction. The the risk here is something that Paul identified is that when you when you take a multi thousand dollar fee and you place it upon all these properties, you are placing on another burden. And there are going to be cases out there where an owner his heart is in the right place, his or her heart is in the right place, and they're just kind of barely keeping up with the taxes and when you drop this six thousand dollar fine on them they're they're just gonna say that's it. That's the straw that broke the camel's back. I'm going to walk away. And then we have an, a property that's moving in the direction of the Essex House or 278 Pine Street um, or 506 Maple, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I think we, we have to be really sensitive about that. And I, in my own completely subjective opinion, I think $3,000 was a pretty good sweet spot. I think the 6000 is it's kind of punitive. It feels like a little too much money. Um, but I know that smarter people than I will think about what the right number um, should be for that. Um, I guess one final issue to deal with is the idea of kind of transferring a property and somebody new comes in and do we start them off at year one or do we say, hey, this property has been vacant for 10 years already so it's not about you, it's about the property. Um, if you If you codify something that says um, okay we, we're going to start you off at year one again then that creates an incentive for people to kind of shuffle properties around like hot That's potatoes right. That's right. Um, like I'm, maybe I'll sell it to my brother or something like that um, so it's a little difficult to think about but maybe something should be worked into the, the ordinance that says well it has to be truly an arm's length transaction to some completely unrelated party that um, is really going to, to, right. to do something different with the property. Um, and I guess the final point is, and I don't, I have no idea exactly what kind of mechanism you could use to do this, but um, as Greg pointed out, Greg's over here, um, somebody who's thinking about buying a building in the city should have an idea of what they're in for, whether it's a $6,000 fee or a $1,500 fee or whatever it is. It really doesn't feel good to me that the concept of somebody comes in here with with high hopes and stars in their eyes, I'm, I'm going to renovate this building, and the first thing that happens is, boom, they get hit with this fee that they had no idea was coming. Um, it, it would be really great if there was some mechanism where people would know exactly what they were going to have to pay before they made the decision, yes, I'm, I'm going to buy this property. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, just, I just have a question for Paul. So as this currently sits, my understanding of it is that if a new person buys the property, and let's assume for the moment it's a real new person, that if they come in with the plan, they'll be under the deferral, and then when they complete the work, they'd be under the waiver. Correct. Regardless of if the property had been vacant for one, five, or ten years. Correct. And I, and I think what uh, Mr. Bosco uh, has pointed out is something that uh, should be allowed and considered as part of the rehab plan approval, where when appropriate, you know, a longer period of time or an expectation that this is a rehab plan for year one of what might be a five-year plan, um, I mean, there, there's going to be, there's no way to craft the words here to address all those circumstances, um, but we definitely need more bright line rules, but there's still going to be gray areas. Right. Yeah. Councilor Jourdain, thank you. On the notice component of, 
you know, what are the registration fees? Could we incorporate that in the municipal lien certificate process? As you oh, absolutely. Know? Yeah, because I think that would give you, Stephen, the transparency of, you know, you have to get a municipal lien certificate to close on a piece of property. And, and then maybe if we included a line that said, oh, there's a $5,000 bill for registration fees back owed. Yeah. So you'll get somebody would be on notice that, you know, hey, this house is well, I would assume you know whether or not a property you're purchasing is vacant or not. So that's number one. But uh number two is that the community has a one of these uh a vacant registration process uh ordinance. Um oh, uh, there was another there was another point he made um that um, I wanted to address. Um, it was the second point you made, S Stephen. It was about um, the the virtue of the uh, of the vacant building registration oh, fee that I sort remember, of yeah, deters then, speculation and that was great. On I totally agreed with that. And then the second point you made was the vice part, which was layering all these costs on. But I think what we're trying to craft in such a way as if you're doing rehab, you can avoid these costs so that we don't create that vice situation where people give up on it. However, what we're trying to do, which is Im implied but not really said in this ordinance, is early interventions on properties. Because the takeaways from the Essex House is it's 10 years vacant, it's 15 years vacant. Um, it's these situations where if people aren't going to step forward with the rehab plan for whatever personal financial reasons, we've got to be able to jump in, take that property and say, you know, we've got we've to do something um, to, to force the issue because these are ultimately becoming public albatrosses. These things ultimately, when they're walking away, they're hiding behind some realty company or, or some LLC, and we're getting left with the bill because they're becoming public nuisances. So I, I think we have to, you know, really do early interventions, the key to this, because we want to avoid these big fines, but really the way to avoid big fines on people is if there is no movement, then we're early intervening. We're, mm -hmm. You're not waiting to year 10. You know, there shouldn't be the situation where the person's paying 10 years of fines. It should be after year three or two. If I mean, if, if we're saying you're registered, you're not doing anything, year two, you're not doing anything, year three, you've got now a building that's been empty for three years. I mean, I think it's that point that the city needs to say, okay, what's the status of the taxes? What's the status on the building codes? What's the status of registration fees? And then we move forward. And we do have the tools to do that. And we right? now have the tools to do that. Right, whether through tax foreclosure or otherwise. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's some of the buildings we don't. We're not getting them at year one. We're getting them at year 10, year 15. I mean, Essex House is a good I mean, you're cleaning up the past sins. Yeah. Right. But now going forward, if we're proactive, we're not going to have that. We should never get this bad again. Mm -hmm. you know? So um, are you all set? All set. So in the language, I think a point that I heard that interested me was around the fake sales or the arm's length transactions. Is there anything in here that protects us in that regard so in writing this out there's not uh, so in writing this out the idea was that the combination of the rehab plan and this offset program would provide some of the alleviation for uh, I mean that very so the action or lack thereof would be the dictator not the process of ownership right okay. one, one of the things I just suggest I, I you know if if we wanted to give a little bit of a grace period for because um, we're really we're talking about these uh, four plus unit or, or mm -hmm. I think really four plus residential four plus units uh, you know when someone's buying them uh, if if uh, the time period were um, something to consider six months vacant for six months to two years so that your first six months are 
exempted. I mean, that might make it a little bit quirky with other parts of the ordinance. Um, I think it's hard to craft something to define arm's length transaction. I think yeah. that adds another but layer. But still, it's deferred if they come in with the plan. Correct. Councilor Lisi? Didn't we talk about how the um, letters would all go out at like one time a year? So I think, you know, if, if you buy it in December and we're, you know, sending letters out in January, then there could be carved out some sort of waiver or um, deferral. That would probably be the deferral so that you, you don't get assessed. If you, if you bought the property within the six months of that letter going out, you're not getting assessed for the first year if you haven't owned the property for a year. So that's always been a tricky issue with this. They're sent out on October 15th. So if somebody bought a property on October 13th, they're getting hit as a uh, vacant vacant property. But we should so that letter should go out because administratively it's going to be easier to just send the letter out, but the re person who receives that letter should be able to say, "I just bought this property yesterday." <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, please give me six months to, you know, get myself into a program, that, you know, to, to avoid that first year fee. So I think that would be one other deferral that I would carve out. So like you wouldn't, you wouldn't be assessed the first year vacant property fee if you own the property for less than six months on the date that the letters go out. Am I making sense? I think that's a good way of putting it. I mean, I, so would it be six months if you own it for six months or less as of October 15th? That's just what I'm thinking off the top of my head, but it seems to make sense. Right. I guess the way I was understanding the ordinance is if you bought the property no matter when you bought it and you went in with a rehab plan, you'd automatically be getting deferred no matter what letter you got. But it would be really difficult, I think, for someone to go in with a rehab plan if yeah, they bought quickly. it. Yeah. If they bought it the day before, or I mean, maybe six, six months is too long. Maybe it's you know four months, a third of the year, or maybe we write in for, with the rehab plan that they have um, either ninety or one hundred twenty or how many reasonable days it would be to present it to be deferred. Mm -hmm. You know, so they get the letter, but if they go in with the plan, you know, I don't know. But for for myself, I would like us to move on this. Yeah. It's not perfect, but it's like 95% there. I'm not hearing um, concrete problems yeah. Yeah. with it. There may be mm -hmm. some gray areas that show up that we'll have to amend down the road. The biggest open thing I hear that people are all over the place about is 3,000, 5,000, 6,000. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm not sure what I think after the fees. After hearing everything, and you've been working on this a lot, where do you come down on that? Because I'd like us to move on this. I, I, I do like the idea of of the three thousand, and, and the reason I'd say the final reason would be that uh, if we're talking about getting serious about leaning these and putting properties in tax title, because mm -hmm. uh, this is going on the taxes, mm -hmm. um, we're still building all of this out and I mean that's just the way it is in every city you know everybody's just still Detroit's still building it out Baltimore's still building it out so our tax title program I don't think is you know is is, is doing an incredible job but I don't think we're at the level now where we could just rapidly respond to the what a six thousand dollar a year uh, increase on the taxes that that difference in the market um, but again, I, I think this is something that should come up every year. I mean, I think there's going to be tweaks. You know, where we are a year from now should be different than where we are now, mm -hmm. um, and, and this will, you know, may need to respond to it. So I, I'd, I would suggest three thousand. Um, but which is I, what's in this? Correct. So with with that sort of modified two tier. Right, but in this proposal. ordinance that we're considering for adoption, the three thousand is in it. Correct. So. So far, we have not amended this draft. Are there any motions to amend the draft? Let's see. I, I want to figure out a way to get that deferral in the one that I was just talking about. So, would, so if we say a new property owner has a grace period of 120 days to submit a plan for rehab? I think where I it can make sense. that do it? I think I want to hear where 
since Paul understands how it works up and down, I want to see what he intuitively understands what I'm saying. All right. I don't know how much I understand. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think where that can make sense is on that table. Uh, so instead of properties that have been vacant for up to two years, if we say properties that have been vacant for three months to two years, um, six months to two years, so that's implying that you, if you're, as of October 15th, if you're not at six months, I mean, that might be one way. Uh, and what page, where are we? In the, in the table of fees? So, um, what page is that? Page four. So, and does that create an additional um, administrative burden on the city to have to track how long these, because you're going to have to then also be tracking the transfer property as opposed to just sending out the letters and letting someone come in and be like, I got this letter. I just bought the mm. property. Um, how do I work with the city? I feel like the, in terms of, you know, intervention, early intervention, getting the letter out to someone and then st and having them come in and like talk to people about what the options are, then they could learn about ways to um, get into a, a, a plan. Um, that, number one, it seems more um, streamlined on the administrative end, and then number two, it, it creates an opportunity to get people that receive that letter plugged into the services and options that they right. can work with. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, all right. So well, I actually have an amendment. Um, at the can we just so on this, the amendment would be to add less than six months to the grid. We were going back and forth about it actually, or let it just flow with the deferral process. Well, we used to have it that the first year there was no fee. Really? I didn't know that. When it, when it was originally enacted? Yeah. What, what did it just say? Well, I mean, the view was especially, like, the, one of the proposals I have is on the same topic as Rebecca, but as it relates to residential, that if you have a single-family home, um, you know, grandma dies, and now the family has to sell grandma's house, well, it's vacant. Yeah. I don't want day one they're going to be assessed a $500 ticket for that. It's, it's, the, the goal has always been that after year one, then there's fines because they're given a grace period to actually go try and sell the house or, or whatnot. So we could reinstate that grace period at a, maybe a modified period of time. And how was that? Do you recall how it was written up? It was written as um, if sure, it, it was over one year that that defined vacant over exactly. one year. Okay. And where are we here? And it says for up to two years. So we just change it to over one year. Right. Properties that had been up vacant less than years. one year was zero. Why are we saying up to two years here? For the lower fee. No, no, no. I think it's first we're looking in definitions, right? Where are we? <laughs> what could get tricky with this, because we're really regulating two different things here, uh, single two-family properties and big blighted properties, mm -hmm. um, oh. and the, va the definition for vacant building covers both. Um, so I think it's tough to amend that. I, I mean, I, I think it might be worth me having a look at how the ordinance was, was written back when that was in effect. I mean, I still do like the idea of, of on this table just putting in, you ah, know, properties that have been vacant for, I mean, we could write, we could just, for the point of really illustrating it, we could say properties that have been vacant for up to a year, zero. Um, I mean, that might be kind of odd because with the residential property, we're saying as soon as it becomes vacant. Um, I mean, I, I think if you... The residential that we wouldn't want to charge. Yeah, the residential one to three, we don't want to, we don't want to charge anything for, for year one. one. Because there's, this happens constantly. Those, those are, those are uh, we don't want to create a penalty for, for regular home transactions. I mean, a relative dies, I inherit right, right. grandma's house, and I go to sell it or whatever, I need time to be able to sell it. Practically, that property would never come up on our uh, on our vacant building list because, and, and so for the residential properties here, where here's where the money side of it and then the receivership side of it kind of you know departs. 
you know, the value of this ordinance in so many ways is having the bank file that registration form the moment that they foreclose on the property. So if we allowed them a year grace period, we would never get that information. The single family property would stay bank owned for a year. And so can you interpret that if, if it's inherited or it's somehow, um, you know, you know the example I'm talking. I mean, right. you're talking the relative who's the, you know, he or she live there by themselves. They now give the house to their kids. I don't want the next day they have to come down and yeah. pay. Oh, I agree. Uh, yeah. A registration fee and uh, you know, and all this type of stuff. I mean, it, there's got to be an opportunity for them to. And, I mean, I wonder. It, it's one of the things where I mean, if that happened at the end of the day, there there has to be some amount of discretion of you know. You look at the. First we don't consider those this. vacant somehow. We eliminate those from the they definition. Would be a right. Appeal. They would be up for appeal. Exactly. I mean. Oh yeah, but out. you know, somebody doesn't want to have to come down. I mean, if. If 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 somebody's relative dies and 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 they need and they sell the house six months later and all of a sudden they get a bill in the mail because the house was vacant and I got to file a fifty dollar unrefundable appeal. And we get we, we get a lot of e the board of health gets a lot of emails in these sort of situations and you know you, you go back to the very first section of this purpose. Um, I mean the purpose here is is blighted properties, vacant properties right. that are causing. You know, I think there has to be some discretion that uh, the Board of Health or, or this appeal panel would have for a situation like that, uh, that, you know, it's just clearly not intended. It's a vacation house or, you know, whatever the situation is, there are some. Uh, so the question is, is there in this ordinance? In the old ordinance, is there, there was a, the discretion? first year, nothing on one to three units, residential. I think I think the situation that you're describing, where you know the property is passing the family, I think that there's enough discretion to say that it doesn't constitute a vacant property. Um, Under this, correct. Okay, okay. As as that's important it, as as to understand. Write it that way. As long as that's what this says. But I think it's hard to sort of delineate out all that of these one circumstances. Thing, carve it out I think it has to. Yeah. All right. Well, what I would ask is that. Somebody makes a motion that we adopt this. If there are unintended consequences that come up, we can amend it. But this seems to be. Yeah, I don't want to be a Nancy Pelosi here. You know, you got to pass it to, to, to read well, it no, or read it I mean, to pass you did it. Have I mean, a good hour plus discussion on it in April, right? All right. Well, now, then, then. Does this reflect? I wasn't on. here, so does it reflect? Yes, it does. What the no, said? He, did, he did a phenomenal okay, job. Okay, so I don't want to. <laughs> but what I want to do is I want to say no fee for residential one to three units under a year. So that's, I'd like to make that as an amendment. I think that we'd ha we could cover that out in terms of uh, there is an exemption somewhere, an exemption section, right? Well, right here, the, uh, section one, top of page four. Residential party properties, one to three units, regardless of duration of vacancy, $500. Where is it? I'm sorry. Top of page four. Four, yes. I want that to say after year one. Could and, and the concern would be in this situation of a, a, a property passing in a family, uh, something of that sort. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I mean, if it's six months, a, a single family house, I mean, I'm not really too worried about those. Those, you know, six months vacant, that's not a big deal. It's Again, when they're years vacant, and there's plenty of them around. My concern is going back to, I'd say, 80% of that, that list is, is bank foreclosures that were getting notification from the bank that a property's become vacant. Yep. That's, I, I'm, I would want to find a way to word what, what the, the, the concern you're addressing, right. but to word in a way that we still keep still the bank the on the hook. Still in the family. He doesn't want to lose the foreclosures. Right. I'm I'm with you. If you Pro can c come up with language, then you know I'm willing to go with what you're suggesting. Family owned. So non bank owned probate uh, property or, probate right, non bank owned non foreclosed. I mean, uh, say it in the affirmative family or in the negative. <laughs> what, Councilor Bartley said. Hmm? What did you say? Non foreclosed. Non bank owned. Non bank owned. Mm -hmm. Non bank owned residential properties. I don't know. Is that legal, though? Can you make can a you can you do a, puni a punishment class because you were bank owned? I don't know. I mean, I think I, I think there's a simpler <laughs> right. Um, it, and again, so the, the circumstance we're talking about here is just that situation where it's going 
uh, through a, a, a family a probate process or something of that sort. Or even a, what if somebody has a, li a life estate deed? Uh, you could have it where there's no probate, right? You could right. have it where the remainder upon death immediately takes the property, but they already own their own property. Now their intention is to sell, and um, and then therefore... Uh, you know, they need time to get a realtor because unfortunately what we if, can't predict when people die. What if we but, said residential you know, properties with one to three units regardless of duration unless in a court process? I think, I think that's a good way of putting it. It, it. You know, we could put an exemption in there for uh, temporary vacancy and, and yeah. to maybe define that out. Temporary vacancy vacation, uh, probate process. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, that. Uh, or, that do it? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Okay. All right. So craft something along those lines. All right. Yeah. So um, that is a motion on an amendment, and that is second. there a second? On favor? Aye. Aye. And then what was it, Rebecca? What did you want to put in? That was. That it. was it. Same thing, yeah. kind of. Okay. Yeah. And we're leaving the three thousand. I like recommended. the three thousand. Recommended. That's fine. Okay. I can, I can live with that. Any other amendments? Um, Hearing none. Hold, uh, hold on. Um, And we are certain that the bills are, should we put something in here that the city should lean these as soon as possible? Should we put that in the ordinance as an amendment? There is, that was added to one of the, um, one of the amendments was to, to really clarify that not only do these get added as municipal charges liens, but they get turned over to the assessor. Okay. I think it's page four, uh, two C. Okay. Page four. See. Oh, yeah, liens. All right, good. And um, are we going to add that to the municipal lien certificate for the city of Hoyoke? Correct. So that's what the, the munis uh, transition right. will allow, all, all this, right. whether it's lien. They'll or capture not. that. Exactly. Okay, very good. All right, I'm good. Thank you. Bless you for doing this work. <laughs> yes. Thank you. I would like to entertain a motion to adopt as amended. And we already added the amendment of the Housing Authority and the uh, G&E and all that. We did. We have yeah. taken a vote on that we did. to add them into so the I'll, list. I'll make a motion to um, approve this as amended and refer to the um, Law Department for putting legal form. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you all. That was a lion's share of work. Yeah. Bless so, you for doing it. So it takes care of 5th, 14, and 15. So, Madam Chair, point of order? Yes, Councilor. Um, so, we've got, well, we just walked out, but um, we've probably got about uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Many things will nine, be left ten, on the table. Ten more items here at the four hour plus mark. Okay, so, but hang on. One minute, just so I can run through a couple of them with you. All right. So six, seven. We skip two. I, I'm talking about what I'm intending to leave on the table okay. because the maker isn't here, or right. the people that were supposed to come couldn't come. All right. So six, seven, sixteen, eighteen, nineteen. I'll go to the discretion of the maker. Those I would see staying on the table. Uh, I would also suggest 23, unless that had to be done tonight, as well as, yeah. um, as well, how about 22, Councilor Lopez? Can we wait on that one? Yeah. Okay. Well, yes. Seven, the two makers are here, but I would very much favor it going on the table. Hang on. Yeah, table seven. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I agree. That could be a bit lengthy. <laughs> you oh, do want a table, you don't want a table. <laughs> <laughs> table seven? Table, or? yeah. Yeah, I oh, okay, good. I thought so. You had me we're nervous there for a minute. That on yeah, the okay. table. But you are also here for item 20, um, which does require a public hearing. All right. Motion well, why don't we table. table all those other ones, and then we'll take up 20. Motion to table as a package, suspending. We, if don't, can't we just leave them on the table? We haven't taken them up. Sure. So then, okay. Um, take up item. Suspend 20. the rules to go to twenty. Second. Do we have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Fabric Councilor Sullivan ordered that the City Council review section six point five four point five 
number five signs institutional use. So there has been a proposed change. I also did receive a call from a representative from Holyoke Medical Center, and the gist of it is that there are limited sizes for signs, and what is being sought is that those certain properties that are in a residential zone be allowed signage as under the BH zone. My understanding is, um, at least in the case of Holyoke Medical Center, they've been talking with planning staff for quite a while about language, and I did get forwarded to me, and maybe we have it here. But we need to have public hearing on this, so. Right, 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 but I had let folks know that I would make, um, their interest and the issue known because it had been in the jacket for a while and then it was clarified for us that we needed to do a public hearing. So I just said I would put it on the agenda so people would know it was moving and that we're going to advertise and right, make go a motion ahead with we it. schedule it for a public hearing. Because there are some hearing. timing issues yep. involved. Okay? All right. Make a motion we table, schedule it for a public hearing. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Suspend the rules to go to 13. Is there a second? Second. second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Item 13, followed by Councilor Jourdain and Councilor Reagan, that an ordinance be created as follows. No elected official, department head, or other city employee shall issue any order that shall knowingly violate any law or regulation of the federal, state, or local government, or the Constitution of the United States, the Constitution of the Commonwealth of Mass, or the Charter of the City of Holyoke, or any lawful order of a court of competent jurisdiction. No such order given shall be valid or shall be enforced by the City of Holyoke or its departments. Make a motion approved and second. put in legal form. It's already in legal form. Motion, so, yep. motion to approve? Yep, this is already in legal form. And uh, I'm, I'm told that this, doesn't, uh, this won't happen, that they're following all rules that they're supposed to. And so this is just a good reassuring ordinance to have to make sure that... Um, you know whatever whatever we're doing that we're complying with state and federal law I just I want to just be clear that the city of Hoyoke follows whatever rules are out there that well, we're let's, supposed let's go to go back to the course. Kevin Jordan rule so that this you know yeah, so yeah I don't, agree. don't, don't so, talk of the death so we have a motion any discussion no on the motion all in favor aye. Aye. aye any no. opposed so four in favor one opposed anything else uh, what's 17? What was the intention with that? Um, Councilor Greeny asked me to bring it up early. He's had this in the jacket for a long time. It is simply in, given the season. Well, motion to take number 17 off the table. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Filed by Councilor Greeny and Leahy that the City Council order that all clothing drop boxes on property throughout the city are the responsibility of the property owner to police and maintain. Any and all such clothing drop boxes shall be kept clean of any clothes and trash that might accumulate outside these boxes. Any violation of this ordinance shall be culpable for a fine of up to $25. Should be noted that all property owners who allow these drop boxes on their property should be in communication with the owners of these boxes to prevent any eyesores in the neighborhoods of Holyoke. Well, I think it's pretty non-controversial. Well, yeah, but I, I'd, like to, well, I'd like to make a motion to uh, send this to Board of Health and get we could get something from them on this because it's a board of health issue is this yeah and then i was also going to suggest maybe we send it to the law department but with a with a copy of an ordinance back to us that we could consider i think that, that makes a lot of sense and then, so. and then we will take it up at another meeting and by then we'll hopefully have board because health when they say property I, I just that makes okay so i'm hearing you say you to know. refer this just to get a draft issue to the board of health and legal for a draft to review at our next meeting. future, me if, a future or, meeting a future yeah. meeting yeah and we, we've got to get feedback from uh, brian on this i agree okay so I'll, I'll, I'll yeah so i'll move then to table in the meantime second all in favor all right okay 25 um, is the last one i, I, I uh, well, two. We have item two. What, what is what is the on item on two? One? We closed the public hearing at the last meeting. I need a motion if we want to consider it. Just for the record, I'm abstaining again on that one. So we don't have draft language, do we? Yes, we do. So it's a tennis ball. We've had the same language <laughs> for. <laughs> 
two months. <laughs> so I would like to make a motion to take it up and um, okay. just send it favor? to legal. Aye. 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 Uh, filed by Councillor Lopez, ordered that the ordinance committee adopt a special permit application for any methadone suboxone clinics coming into the city. So at the last meeting, we closed the public hearing and the issue that was brought up was the idea of adding business highway zone to the industrial general zone because there had been objection that it was too narrow, too limiting. So that's really the sticking point that we've had on this. Yeah. Um, but I, you offered that to broaden it? Absolutely. I think that, that will be, um, I mean, uh, I know some city councilors saying that it's limiting the 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 methadone clinics and all that, but I think that having BH and IG, I think that that's a compromise and, and move forward. I, I will hate to open this to any residential. That's why I, I don't want to go there. So that's what I'm proposing. So, so that would be an amendment to the current draft which said, yes. which said IG only, yep. which received great objection. Mm -hmm. Is there a second to that amendment? Kevin Campbell. Is there another amendment? He's abstaining. Yes. He can't participate. Uh, I mean, if we go back to IG, we're not going anywhere. No. You could add um, broader business zones as an alternative, expand it I beyond am. BH into mm -hmm. more I business zones. I just feel a little bit at a handicap without number one having the language before us and having um, the full list of zones that could be um, potentially elected. That's why. Well, we all do have the language. Yes. We've had it for some time. It's the same information, yeah. Um, Crystal, a question. Do we have a time? That would be great. Do, um, did we, have a we have eight. To give you a printer? <laughs> we did. Oh, yeah, did you actually get it? Yes. Wow, that's awesome. Oh, that's, well, thank you for letting us know. Printer um, off a microphone. My concern, Crystal, is if we're going to run into a time limitation to act. We have a closed public hearing. We have a recommendation from planning. And I think there's a window of time that we have to act. Um, yeah, while she's doing this, Madam Chair, can we take up um, it's just? Yes, we can. Uh, there's there's number sixteen. That one is kind of floating around. Uh, what, what's, what's our intention with that? I left it. And twenty. Th was the, ma the magic package. Okay, that, that, that's not a table. Okay, great. Thanks. I, mean, I, think, I think we only have twenty-five left. Which I, I say let's. Isn't can we? Um, okay. Can we um, table this while we're waiting for Crystal to yes, readdress us and head yep. to 25? Yes, that's my hope. Okay, that's so let's table this one now. Motion to table. On, and there's a second. Second. All favor. All right, motion to take on number 25. All favor. All right. Item 25, filed by Councilor Jourdain, that the ordinance be amended to increase parking fees as follows. $1 per hour for both meters and garage, $60 per month for garage. Sounds good to me. Yeah, so when you see Councilor Jordan filing orders to increase taxes and fees, you know they're low. Uh, and if you happen to see our very um, astute city auditor um, wrote us a report that went on to say we're losing approximately $400,000 a year below the revenues below our budget that we had stipulated that these fees and uh, we're going to be sufficient to at least cover our costs of operating the parking system in the city so this is supposed to be self-reliant and two we've gotten so egregiously low at this point you're talking Northampton is 75 cents an hour on a meter it's an hour and, um, 
It's a dollar now. It, it's a dollar. And Springfield's two dollars. We're at twenty five no, cents. Springfield's not two dollars an hour. Let me Springfield fifty cents an hour. Let, let me assure you of that. Okay. So all right. Um garage in Holyoke is forty per month, Northampton ninety per month, Springfield is one oh five to one thirty five a month. Okay, so so Madam Chair may I, so Bartley? Yep. Yeah. I just like just, just along that line, Kevin. I mean, I think this is this is fine, but um, city employees, I, you know, I don't, you know, I don't think they'd be super psyched about paying a fee. Do, do they? Do they? I have think to... they get a pass. They get a parking pass with the. Sticker. Okay. Okay. So they, they don't pay any kind of parking, right? Okay. There's that. You still got a ton of police cars in. I'm pretty sure we get stickers now. Oh, I have a sticker for on the my parking car. Gar <laughs> parking garage. Okay, well, there's a ton of police cars still in the um, Peru garage. You know, they, 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 they jam up 20, 20 spaces. So, you know. So there, we should file an order to get them out of there. Well, I don't, you know, are we I have. For I, I have. It, it's, it's just a, you know, so the city auditor comes parking. in. A, 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 yeah. it's, it's a fine recommendation, but, you know, let, let's, let's kind of clear out some of these issues here. They've got a wonderful police station there. Why don't they park their cars at 138 Appleton? In the interest of time, can we stay focused, and then we'll need well, separate well, orders for the other. Well, 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 this is focus. I mean, it, it's just, this. So it, it's it's winnowing out the number of parking spaces. So. But are we in a shortage? I'm saying we are. Councilor Lisi, um, I would like to suggest that um, we always want to get people off the street and into the garages. So I would suggest um, doing a 50-hour. I'm sorry, <laughs> 50 cents per hour garage fee with the $1 meter fee on the street um, because that's how you make you know long-term parking in the garage more attractive instead of having people just pump the quarter. So the, the garage so hourly to 50 amendment. cents. Is there a second? Second. But I mean, it's not going to take care of the form I know, the, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, the meters, uh, let's see here, for both, yeah. I mean, you're giving an incentive. How about if we just made it 25 cents reduction? That's a 25%. As opposed cents? to half. Was that for, for, okay? All right. It, so why it, don't we do 75 cents an hour in the garage and a dollar on the street? It's still a reduction. Instead of 50. Is there a second? Because we do that? have to make a 400 grand. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So on the Third Amendment, all in favor? Aye. 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 I want to say no. Okay, four to one. So and the can, vote. Can I ask a question sure. about the auditor's letter? Like, how are we going to be able to recoup? You know, four thousand dollars. I mean, to me, it's like that. That's it's money that we already missed an opportunity on, and I don't want to create. Um, you know, like I don't think that the downtown parking is like so desirable that we need to. Um, keep people moving and to, to Linda's point like there's not a lack of parking so no I think the point is based on the current use he told me my proposal would close the 400 grand gap the goal? so it, we're actually going a little bit below my original proposal because we're going to lower the garage by 25 cents to 75 so and we, that's closing it in the next year yeah yeah that's so, the, that's going to increase the, the the it's off by four hundred thousand dollars per year right now so the proposal on the table is to increase annual revenue by 400 grand and this is the mechanism to do it so every year we've been in the whole 4,000 on the parking garage. um well it's gotten more because we've got more costs because now we're paying for suffolk street bond so it wasn't so that added uh six million dollars to the bill and we got to pay that did we leave the monthly at 60. uh yes my proposal is to go from 40 to 60. That's still. It's sixty is fine, but I think yeah. the the hourly rate in the garage for we long term. So we voted four one to make street a dollar. A dollar garage on the street. Seventy five cents. Seventy five for the and garage. Sixty and a month. Sixty a month for the garage. So the seventy five cents for the garage is a three hourly to, rate. Is a three to two vote, not a four to one. Three to two. Who, what were the, who voted what way on that? David voted no on that one. I voted no. Okay, and who else voted no? I'm voting no on that. You're against 75 cents. Yeah. I, you I, want it 50. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, you have the winning vote, so. All right, all right. Well, we can debate it, it. <laughs> for an hour in council. 
Yeah. Oh, no, I won't. Believe me, I won't. <laughs> I, I okay, that's We've fine. been known to debate lesser things longer. Okay. <laughs> All right, so, so on, the, on the, the package is as amended. Right now it's... A hundred, uh, excuse me, a hundred, a dollar on the street, <laughs> 75 cents on the garage, and 60, and 60 a month for the. Pass. I thought that's what we just, you just. No, voted we just on. did an, we only voted on my amendment. Yes. Okay. On the now amended we, motion. On the overall package. Yep. I'm, I move that adoption. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. I'm going to vote no again. No, I vote no. Okay. Three, two. All right. So we're going to, so, so. You got the you got the winning vote. I mean, it's moving out of committee with payroll re recommendation, but I like fifty cents. I mean, and, and there may be a little back. I mean, forth, I, I, but whatever. Because at the end of the day, it's not. Well, like I mean, we need the votes at the council to adopt it. I mean, if it's really, I mean, I mean, I'm not. Fifty cents is better than twenty-five cents. I mean, I, I don't want to see this fail. But we can amend it on the floor we'll if, if we need to. All right. But yeah. All right. It's it's valid. All right. That's fine. I mean, you know. whatever. All right, so here we go. Thanks for Thank um, you. printing five copies. It, uh, <laughs> oh, here we go. Okay, great. Do you have what you need? Yep. Okay. So, I, I did um, actually. Councilor Lopez? Sorry. I, I'm trying to see. Um, <laughs> so it's just that I don't want to see it in a residential. I I'd rather see it die. If if I mean, then it will be all all over. So do I hear you saying that you would be open to adding the other business zones? Yes. Yeah. So that would be B L B C B G along with B H and B E. I don't even know what what's B E. So uh, I have this. Does anybody all... know what property? That's I don't know. B E. B -E. I'm sorry. Entryway business district. And that's oh, different well. than business highway. I don't know. It's... But anyway, it's Sounds business. Great. <laughs> it's business. So, um, and then we have um, IP, which is industrial park. Yeah, but that's yeah, industrial that's so park. I mean, but I can see, uh, you know, doctor's offices in an industrial park. Yeah. And it will be, it will be right, on but the this, special permit. This no, ordinance right. has I nothing to do with the doctor's office. I could be my office early. Thank you, all. It doesn't, res it has nothing to do with the doctor's office and what they do or don't do. That's been clarified. I guess I'm saying like a medical office building in which they could be cited. I mean, over by where I live, it's it's in the Northampton um, area on along Route 5, right before you get actually into Northampton. Mm -hmm. They just erected two huge um, professional office buildings with lots of medical offices. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that I could well, see that type all of right. project going So there. you want to add IP? Yep. That's fine. All right, so if we brought in those zones, which I think then is going to mirror pretty much a clinic. I don't have the whole book in front of me, but I think um, clinics are zoned similarly under our current zoning. Uh, but they don't sure. have the special permit, I don't think. Yeah, right. That's the, that's the provision. Right. So... Um, the amendment now would be to include all the business zones and all of the industrial zones and establish the special permit. So we have a motion, and, and do we have a second? second? Yes? Yep. Okay. Any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? No. Uh, <laughs> Did I you? was going to vote no as well. I wanted to vote yes on the amendment to get it in there, but I'm, I'm voting no on the whole package. So it's amended, but no for recommendation. So we have a 2-2, two, two, so we can't go forward with the recommendation. The committee can choose to vote it out without a recommendation. Sure, you can vote no. Without a recommendation? Yeah, under discussion? Sure, yeah, Councilor Bartley. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not going to... Uh, 
uh, support something where, I, I, yeah, again, I, thought, I like the special permit process, but now we've expanded to every single zone in the city. This is just, now it's just an unwieldy, um, I mean, th this is a, uh, a solution looking for a problem. And so I, I don't, I don't want to support this the way it, with the amended. So I, I, okay, I, so I, under so discussion, I'm not, I'm not, what would you support? Because you don't uh, no, support I, I would I would H. support. I, would, I, would, I don't want any of the amendments. Uh, I would support this as written. I'm fine with it as it is. With the IG. I'm fine with it as it is. Yes. With the IG. Yes, that's correct. So, so I'm, we have I'm, two I'm, schools of thought. I'm fine and with it as, as we're it. I'm striving through a compromise. Well. I mean, th this this was this was the original plan. Yes. But now yes. we've got this whole broaden plan. So I, I won't support the broaden plan. I'll support the original plan, but not not the broaden. Well, plan. right now we had voted to amend the proposal, yes. but then the amended proposal. Basically. is not moving forward. So as the maker of the order... I, I just want to go back to the original one, IG, and then second. whatever happened... Second. Okay, so we are now back to amending it, back to the original order. We have a motion to leave it at IG. We have a second to leave yep. it at IG. So, that's all what in I favor? all the time, yes, yeah. Uh, yes. Aye. 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 Well, that's what I... So we will move it out of committee, three to one, leaving it IG. Motion to adjourn, is if that's okay, Madam Chair? Yes, yes sir. All right. all right, motion to adjourn. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you all. Yeah, just, I just said, oh, no, 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 no. I, I, I.